Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome into our Linux show, all Linux show today. This is our little pre-show that we do here on the Computer America program. Uh, Marcel Gagné uh, is our Linux correspondent, and, you know, if you have a question about Linux, this is the place for you to be. So we'll be starting in about a minute and a half, uh, and, um, but it should prove to be a very interesting show, as it always is, with Marcel. Um, so sit back, relax, enjoy two hours all about Linux here on today's Computer America show. One minute until showtime. Okay. <sighs> Twenty seconds. <laughs> Ten seconds. Your show will go live in five seconds. Four, three, two, one. Broadcasting live, it's America's longest-running national radio talk show on computers, Computer America, hosted by national columnist Craig Crossman. Look for Craig's weekly column in your favorite newspaper. This show is being beamed nationwide at ComputerAmerica.com. Keep it here for technology news, computer products, guest interviews, and your phone calls. You're listening to Computer America. Hello, and welcome into the Computer America show. It's the nation's longest-running, nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers. Computer America is heard around the world and coast-to-coast. Coast. And I'm your host, Craig Crossman. And I'm your co-host, Ben. <laughs> and uh, there he is. And uh, welcome into a Thursday edition of the Computer America show. Um, got a great program uh, planned for you. Uh, it is all about Linux on today's program. Anything you want to know about Linux... Um, this is the place for you to be. I mean, you know, Linux is an important operating system. It's been around for a long time. Most all of the Internet is run on Linux. Yes, it is. It's true. And um, you may want to deny it, <laughs> and, uh, but it's the, it is the fact. And uh, we're going to uh, talk Facts about have it. have never stopped people from denying things. <laughs> That's exactly. very true. Yes. <laughs> oh, sorry. Shh, shh, shh. Yeah. I'm yeah. not talking yet. And you should be muted, too. You have your mute now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> how, could, how could he interrupt if he was muted? I know. How could he? What? All right. So, uh, anyhow, if you have a comment or a question, give us a call at 347 884 8881. Better yet, if you, uh, if you have a question or comment for a guest, uh, any page at computeramerica.com in the upper right hand corner, it says submit a question. Just click that. Uh, it'll take you to a question submission page. You can type it in and. Um, Ask your click the submit button and Ben and I will see it immediately and we'll act accordingly on that. That's the other thing you can do. You can also watch the live video stream. Head over to computeramerica.com and uh, click on the show lounge and you'll be joined to the show already in progress. Um, so this is just that's some of the ways that you can uh, uh, interact with us here at Computer America. Everything we do is at our internet home of our radio broadcast, computeramerica.com. So that said, uh, anything else uh, you want to mention before we get Marcel on the uh, show? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, you know, be sure to tune in tomorrow as well because we'll be giving away a wonderful prize to a lucky listener. Yes. But uh, other than that, no, I think we should just bring uh, Marcel on. Well, Marcel Gagné is the author of several books, including Moving to Linux, Kiss the Blue Screen of Death Goodbye, now in its second edition. Other books he's written include Moving to Ubuntu Linux, and his newest title is Moving to Free Software. He was also a Linux Journal monthly columnist. His column was titled Cooking with Linux. Marcel was also a regular columnist for Linux Magazine, and he was senior editor and columnist for Ubuntu Magazine and a number of other 
publications. Uh, please welcome author and columnist, and now Computer America correspondent, Marcel Gagné to the show. Marcel, welcome into Computer America. How are you? Oh, I'm well. Thank you. Thank you for welcoming welcoming me onto the show. I was I was, try, I was trying to look intelligent, sitting over here, <laughs> stroking my chin, you know, and uh, and 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 waiting to say something, uh, you know, pithy and and fascinating. Well, hello there. Good to see you, Ben. Nice to see you too. He's stroking your chin, a sign of intelligence. <clears throat> well, you know, did you ever watch that Star Trek episode where where Data is is Data? You know, and I, I stole this from Star Trek: Next Generation. Data sitting there going, he says, "If I stroke my chin thusly, do I appear?" More intelligent. This is data. This is data asking the question. Right? Do I appear more intelligent? Did data <laughs> no go data. through like a, a Sherlock Holmes, you know, kind of phase? Very oh, did. They've done everything. I love Sherlock Holmes. I, I I have to make a confession right here, okay? I'm a science fiction fantasy geek. I mean, I, I'm I'm a technology geek, but but I also have I also have uh, you know a couple of, of Fascinating things that I'm totally into. I love Sherlock Holmes. Every conceivable incarnation version you can imagine of Sherlock Holmes. At Christmas time, I got a book called *The Great Detective* that I requested. I mean, it was one of my requested titles for Christmas. It's a it's a beautiful book. I read it over the course of just a few days, and it's all about the history of Conan Doyle and Sherlock Holmes and all the incarnation, the TV shows, the you know, including the modern adaptations and the you know, and the you know, the the earlier adaptations of it. I just I just cannot get enough, you know, of, of Holmes. It's amazing. Do you watch the TV show Elementary? Yes, I do. I love that. Also, I, I've always had a crush on Lucy Liu. Oh. <laughs> My wife knows this, by the way, so we're cool on that, okay? <laughs> but I've, I've always had a crush on Lucy Liu, so, you know, I mean, if, if, if anybody was going to play Watson and make me happy, good grief. <laughs> I never thought of uh, Watson as being female until that uh, television show. And uh, also, I, I guess this is a spoiler, but uh, um, his arch nemesis was female. Uh, what's yes. The, the uh, what's the name? Um, I'm blocking. Moriarty. Moriarty. Moriarty turns out Mrs. And, Holmes. And, and no, turns, she's not Mrs. No, Holmes. No. <laughs> and she turns out to be a, a, a love interest for it too. Uh, well, in in the in Sherlock Holmes lore. You know, yeah. uh, going way, way back, there's this reference to the woman. You know, this, and, and and she gets like, she gets in the actual Sherlock Holmes story, she gets like, you know, thirty seconds of billing. She's, you know, she's, she's this minor character who sweeps in and sweeps out and sweeps yeah. Sherlock along with it. And so there's this whole mythos, you know, around the woman. Yeah. And uh, and if they were going to create the love interest, and you know, in there in the um, in the American reboot, Elementary, um, I thought it was rather fitting and cool yeah. that they should, uh, you know, have a female Moriarty who just happens to be the woman. So yeah. I loved it. I thought it was great, and um, yeah, I, I like the casting. I like everything about the show. It's great. Yeah, he does a terrific job. <clears throat> I, uh, the uh, actor who plays uh, uh, Tommy so. Lee Jones. And, oh and, no, not Tommy Lee Jones. What am I saying? <laughs> no, no, not Tommy Lee Jones. <clears throat> but he. Uh, Tommy. Uh, Tommy. Yeah, uh, he. I've seen him in other roles, and he's nothing like the character that he portrays with the actor. It's it's it's, it's completely um, pseudo the character that you're seeing. That the actor Johnny Lee Miller. Johnny Lee Miller is nothing like that. I mean, yeah, no, no. I mean, this was the guy who I don't know if you remember Hackers, the movie Hackers. He started. Oh God, that is like ancient. That's like yeah. a billion years ago. Yeah, he started in that, and, and <laughs> that was more true to you know what he's like. But uh, anyhow, Re really, that was that long. He, I yeah. did not know that was him. Yeah. I may have to go back and watch it again. You know, I barely made it through the first time I watched that movie, and I should have loved that. Yeah, I know. It was, it was so weird. It was oh, so, man. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, hey, you know, it was Hollywood's interpretation. That, that, and people weren't as quite as computer savvy as they are today, so they accepted a lot of that stuff. It's, oh, well, that. yeah, true, true. Um, there, there's, a, there's a new show. Have you seen the show Limitless? Yes, I love that show. Oh. I, I love that show as well. I almost... I, I almost had a heart attack on the third episode or something like this. I think it was the third or fourth. First of all, I love the movie. You know, oh, I I, I've asked people like S Sally looked at me after watching the movie, and she just turned to me and she said, "You would take the pill, wouldn't you?" And I said, "Oh, <laughs> in, a, in, a <laughs> in a heartbeat." Yeah. I'll it's worry about the problems later. I would totally take the pill. <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't know how I could resist it. But uh, but we were watching the we were watching the show, and it was like the third or fourth episode, and they're talking about going in and stealing and and uh, not stealing, but uh, the, you know, taking this uh, suspect's computer equipment. 
Mm-hmm. And then the guy says, we've got his hard drive as well, and he holds up a power supply in his hand. <laughs> oh, no. and, and, oh, seriously. And, and, I mean, I forgave the show after that because it's been a great show, and I still love the show. Mm-hmm. Um, although the, the turn that it's taking right now, I'm kind of wondering where they're going with this. You know, I mean, I'm not saying it's bad, no. but you know, I, I have problems with what they're and, doing with it at the moment. And since he produces the show, we've had a number of uh, reappearances of the original character in, in Limitless. Yes. Yes, uh, who's, who plays a senator uh, who's going yeah. after a presidential bid. Yeah, uh, you know. so it, 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 it's, it's very interesting. Well, um, going, uh, you know, just fo- kind of following the technology angle on that one, holding up the power supply, maybe he thinks that if he doesn't have power, he can't get access to his computer because... Yeah, I, think, I think you're giving him way too much credit there, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> it was just—it was one of those scenes where they obviously yeah. told the actor hold up the computer, hold up the drive or something, and he reached down and grabbed the first thing that he saw and held it up, and he said, "We've got his hard drive." And it's like, no, you're holding his power supply. Retake that scene for God's sakes! But no, nope, it, you know, it, it lasts—it lasts for like thirty seconds. I mean, it's like you know, thirty seconds. Who am I kidding? Five seconds. So I, I, I should go back and watch that because you know they you have it. Should. On. Watch that. Pro, pro, it's like the third and fourth television. episode. I almost had a heart attack watching that. Pro, primetime television and technology is is the worst. Like, like anyone who's seen any CSI <clears throat> television show out there, half the technology they do is complete bumpkiss. And and and, and great uh, uh, Criminal Minds, I think, is the worst. Ugh. they have a stereotypical nerdy chick. And, uh, I, I can't do it. Yeah. You know when you when you watch a show over the period or over a period of several years. Okay, um, and of course on Netflix, it's particularly easy to do that. You know, you yes. sit there and you you start binge watching a TV show. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, things like um, uh, West Wing, for instance, um, was one where they start out and they have these particular types of computers. They've got the you know the big bulky terminals on their desk, and by the end of the show, you know they've got you know th- you know L- LCD panels and so forth. And uh, and I, I've watched other shows like that where you can see the march of technology across right. the show. Yeah. Castle is another one like that. It's like you know they had these these big blo- I mean it's been going on for nine seasons now. Or something. Yeah. Bones was another show like that. You know ten seasons. And and just the march of technology across just 10, 12 years is so intense. And so and, immense, and the, you see, they get to see the characters age too. You know, <laughs> 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 rapidly. Over. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's interesting because I watch Castle and and I watch uh, um, uh, the other show you just mentioned uh, that um, uh, at, at your Criminal Minds, uh, ten seasons, and uh, you can see you can see them aging. You can see the and you see the the shift of technology. That's very very true, and uh, uh, it's there. Uh, listen, I, I, want, <laughs> I just want listeners to know. I forgot to mention this. Um, if you go to uh, computermerc.com and you click on the uh, Today Show, you will also see a link there uh, at the bottom. Uh, you, know, you click on uh, Marcel's image and you it goes to the show description of today's show. There's a link there that says Cheat Notes. Uh, just click on that. It'll open up a Google Docs document and you'll be able to see uh, everything that we're talking about. It's dated uh, you know, today, February the 18th, uh, six more weeks of winter. <laughs> there are links. There, there are important things that Marcel has taken the time to assemble together for you, and uh, so you can kind of follow along everything that we're talking about on today's show. And again, it's under the cheat notes. Whether you're looking at ComputerAmerica.com or I think it's also on the Blog Talk Radio uh, dot, uh, dot net is uh, is also displaying them as well. So we have the cheat notes. And, and believe it or not, there's actually a lot of information. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that has to do with Linux on the cheat notes, despite uh, what we've been doing so far at the introduction. Okay, all right, all right. Before we move on, I have to do two. Uh, you know, we're we're, get, we're gonna do just two more. Like like let's let's get this out of our systems, okay? Well, all right. Before you do that, I yeah. just then if you're watching the live video stream, Ben will also d- can display the cheat notes in the uh, background as well as some of the links that we're going to be talking on today's show. If you're watching the live video stream, you can see Ben display those things as well. Okay, what else did you want to mention, uh, Marcel? Oh, yeah, just just since we're talking, since we're talking, like you know, um, if you have not seen the British show Misfits, uh-huh. okay, you must must find it and watch it. It's freaking brilliant. No, I, didn't swear. I just said freaking. It's brilliant. The yeah. idea is you've got four, five ne'er do wells who are doing community service. They're young offenders doing community service. There's this freak storm that comes through and gives them all superpowers. It's just hilarious, brilliant, funny, dark, and I do mean dark at times, like black humor. Wonderful, wonderful stuff. Just it's great. 
Is it on, on Netflix? Netflix? Yes, it's on Netflix. It's five seasons. It's a British show, and of course, which means, of course, each season is like six episodes long. So I mean, you can you can uh, burn that one through, burn through that one fairly quickly. Uh, but it is it is balls of fun. We just sort of you know how Netflix recommends things to you. I mean, it came yeah. up and said, yeah. "Here's one five stars. You really would love this show." You know, and it's like, well, okay. <laughs> uh, to be fair, though. Uh, you know, we've talked about this on the show like over the past week. You know, with uh, everything that they're do- that Netflix is trying to do with blocking VPNs, <laughs> uh, I believe that Netflix is only available for Canadian Netflix. Well, like that's a problem, dude. Uh, <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. Did I say that on the air? I did not mean to say that on the air. Well, I mean, <laughs> if you're in the U.S. listening to this and you go to Netflix looking for Misfits, you will not find it. Oh really? I did not see. I did not know that. Yeah. I did not know that. Not that I personally would ever use an unblocking service, you know, right. or that I would ever bother going around it once Netflix blocked my unblocking service. Like, <laughs> <laughs> not yeah. that I would ever do that. And I would <laughs> never do unblock, a block, a block, unblock, unblock, unblock. You know what's interesting about all that? Okay, is that technically speaking. And, yeah. and I, tech, I mean, you can get as technical or non-technical as you want. There's nothing illegal about doing this. Yeah, we've reported on it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's it's not illegal. I mean, they can block you. Okay, they have every right to try to block you. They have every right to try to lock you into a particular region and so forth. But the fact of the matter is, it is not a crime anywhere that I'm aware of, certainly not in Canada, uh, for you to use a VPN, you know, and pretend you're in a different country to watch shows. So, so it's not even a crime. Um, it's just an inconvenience, and I mean, I I don't know how many times I've watched it on, uh, you know, you're you're looking at a web page or something like that, and it says, oh, here's an interesting video that has to do with a news story we're covering. You click the video, and it says not available in your region. It's like, you know, come on, dudes, give me a break. It's not like it's complicated to get around this anyway. So all you're doing is inconveniencing me. Yeah. You know, and, and I don't know how many millions of other people who know how to get around this anyway. So you're not making any friends, you know, to, to, to all of us. Uh, like, I get it. You guys have got problems with licensing. You know what? Figure them out. All right? But don't uh, punish the people who use the technology. By the way, a misfit is correct. We get animal misfits, but that's a <laughs> that. I have a feeling it's not the same thing. Yeah, uh, no, that's a, that's a lovely show about, uh, you know... <laughs> Hippos hanging out with alligators. You know, it's it's animals that don't belong in their social. Dogs space. and cats living together. We can all relate. Yeah. And another one called Jordis, uh, which I don't recognize. And that's the other. And it comes on the Misfits. So basically, it is not available in the United States. Uh, Ben's correct. So, uh, I, I I do the legwork before I run my mouth off. You are you are such you are amazing, Ben. I mean that. I mean yeah. that. Okay, The Martian was amazing. The Martian was amazing. Was The Martian amazing? That. Yeah. Yes, I saw The Martian. I didn't see that, but but I did see someone put a picture of uh, uh, who who's the lead guy uh, um, of uh, of the Martian. Matt Matt no yep. Mark Matt uh, not Matt Matt Damon Matt Damon yes yeah yes, someone, Matt put Damon. A, someone put a picture of Matt Damon next to the potatoes in the grocery store. Um, <laughs> you know you know what's really you know what's really sad. There was a poll where they found out that there was some ridiculously high percentage of Americans that thought. He had actually been stranded on Mars. That this was real. Oh my gosh! You know, and it's like you're serious. Seriously, there are people who actually believe. It's sad. It's so so sad. And finally, just before we move on, Deadpool. I haven't seen yes. Deadpool uh, yet. Let's get him started. Ben loved Deadpool. Did he? I am so looking forward to seeing it because it's. I mean, it's sort of like a Kill Bill in the sense that it's ultra. It's so incredibly ultra violent that you know, three minutes in, you're not even going to notice the body count anymore. <laughs> Oh, uh, well, I, I, I mean, first of all, he, he he counts down the bullets, but that's a little bit of a spoiler. <laughs> but um, no, like, like it, Kill Bill, where Kill Bill was kind of action packed and it had good story and drama and all that kind of thing, and you know, it had very very good acting. Uh, you know, yeah. Rock, or, you know, Deadpool it had, it, Deadpool had Lucy Liu too, by the way. I want to point out. Yeah. Right. But Deadpool is so comedy packed. It's not even at, like I I I don't care about the gore or the humor, all that. It just it it, it blends so well with the humor. That it was awesome. It was good. You'll enjoy it. Don't bring the kids. The first yeah, time I well, yeah, no kidding. It's rated the, R for one thing. The yeah. first time I walked into the movie theater, the first person I saw was a seven-year-old dressed in a full Deadpool costume. Like, <laughs> you know, ki- people were bringing their young kids in to watch Deadpool, and yeah. uh, I, I would not recommend that. But you will enjoy Deadpool. 
Marcel. Okay, this is the last. This is the last movie thing. Okay, years ago, this is this is to go with what you just said, Ben. Years ago, and this is like years ago when the first Jurassic Park came out. I mean, kids today are different. Like you can't scare a kid today. You know what I'm right. saying? I have an eight-year-old, and I mean, I've played shows for him when he was seven and six. That when I was a kid, these shows terrified me. And he turns and he looks at me like, seriously, Dad? <laughs> <laughs> It's like, no, this was scary when I was a kid. It was. <clears throat> you ever seen Monsters, Inc.? Yes. You know, where, you know the, 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 uh, the, the, the crab dude, he goes, kids today, you just can't scare them the way you used to anymore. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Yeah. I'm... All right, li Linux. Anyway, um, <laughs> shall we talk Linux just for yeah. a laugh? Yes, but let's, but let's, let's start off with today's wine as we, oh, okay. as we introduce this, okay? All right. Well, today's wine is a uh, is a uh, is a uh, McQuiggan uh, Black Label Shiraz. It's um, as as a Shiraz. It's um, it's it's kind of a nice deep dark wine. It's got you know the the peppery taste that you expect out of it. Um, it's it's lovely actually. I. I buy this wine on a fairly regular basis. Not every day, obviously, but you know I buy this wine fairly regularly because it's um, it's. It's reasonably inexpensive. It's it's really good, and like I said, you know, if you like that that little tiny bit of Shiraz bite to it, it's um, it's it's a lovely wine. It's a great wine, deep dark red. Mm. Uh, is this the one? This is an Australian. Uh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. It's an Australian wine, um, and uh, that's what it's called, McQuiggan Black Label. It's um, you know, I, I was gonna I was gonna point out it's multi award winner and so forth, but you know. You know, those wines are multi you, have the with you, you can hold up. I do, I do. See, see I'll, I'll hold it right up to the. There we go. Yeah, let me see. Yeah. A quick oh, yes. black label. Okay. Okay. It's it's lovely. It's it's highly recommended. Highly okay. recommended. All right. So uh, again, we're going to follow the uh, the the show notes entitled uh, Six More Weeks of Winter." Yeah, well, six more weeks of yeah. I mean, it's entitled six more weeks of winter because you know it was, it was Groundhog Day just you know I mean two weeks ago, right? It was Groundhog Day, and the problem with Groundhog, I mean, and that's the reason I called it six more weeks of winter. The problem with Groundhog Day is, of course, you know, if he sees a shadow, if he doesn't see a shadow. On one hand, if he sees a shadow, it's like uh, you know uh, there's six more weeks of winter. If he doesn't see a shadow, spring arrives in six weeks. Has anyone actually bothered to think about the idea that this is exactly the same thing? <laughs> there's no difference between there's six more weeks of winter and spring arrives in six weeks. Come on! <laughs> like, it's six weeks no matter how you cut it, okay? <laughs> See, and, and, and the problem that I have with the, 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 the rodent forecasting of weather <laughs> is that there's not even a unanimous decision by the rodents. Like, No, every other rodent in every town that does it, right. like Pesca, Pesca Quali, uh, you know. Punks uh, and Phil. That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got Wyerton Willie up here, and um, it's like you know they, they don't even agree. agree with each. They don't even agree with each other. Huh. Those so. lines of communications in you know, between them. But just anyway, six more weeks. Six more weeks of winter or spring arrives in six weeks. Take your pick. Okay, I'm going to do a shout out to a good friend of mine, um, uh, Bruce Byfield, who is a um, he's a tireless advocate of Linux and open source software, and uh, his new book is coming out uh, like. Any day now, like real soon now, and it's called Designing with LibreOffice. LibreOffice, of course, is the uh, is the uh, open source um, suite of uh, office applications, which includes uh, you know word processors, spreadsheet, presentation graphics, and so forth. Um, it's by far the most mature. Uh, you know, a suite that you'd hold up as a replacement for Microsoft Office, for instance. And of course, it's completely free. It's completely free to download. It's available for uh, Linux, Mac, I believe, as well as Windows. Um, it's, I mean, it's highly recommended. I've, I've done several books on it. I write articles with it. Um, and uh, I, re I also read uh, Bruce's book. Uh, in fact, I blurbed his book. So, <laughs> so I, I want to do a shout-out to Bruce Byfield, who's a tireless advocate of Linux and open source, and uh, his new book, Designing with LibreOffice. Go, Bruce. All right. And Bruce is a Canadian, by the way, living out in, in British Columbia, which means he's almost not a Canadian because he doesn't really experience winter. So, you know, he's, he's, you know they're, they're Canadians by name and by geography only, but they don't experience winter, so it's... Eh. <laughs> I'm going to be in trouble for that, aren't I? <laughs> I, I, I didn't know that, you know, Canadians had to be forged in the in the frozen heart of Canada. We do. We do. We also need to be able to 
create and produce our own canoe by the age of 14, or you lose your citizenship. Oh, okay. Yeah, you have to be able to hew it out of an old log and, and um, you know, well, and wash it down and... the river. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's do any of that. Well, let's do this first story. This is really, as you say, insane. I, I love this. I love this. It's amazing. Uh, it's a story about computer memory, or it's memory, uh -huh. uh, that can store, what, 360 terabytes of data. Terabytes. Terabytes, 360 terabytes of data for, get this, for 14 billion, that's a billion with a B, 14 yeah. billion years. Yeah. Good grief. Now, I mean, right now, uh, one, of, one of the arguments against cloud computing that you hear on a regular basis is what happens to your data. Um, uh, just recently, uh, um, was it Barracuda Networks offered a, um, a backup storage option. I think it's Barracuda. Correct me if I'm wrong here. Uh, maybe Ben can go look it up. But they 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 decided to close down the service. Uh, it's it's not a cloud, uh, it's, it's not a cloud system like uh, Dropbox or Google Drive or something like that. It was it was specifically a backup. I remember um, Barracuda. That that was that that was um, that was they, a song very popular. Yeah, yeah. no, but the, they did a lot of advertising. Uh, they they were a, a, a network, uh, some sort of a backup. Uh, or no, they were, they were anti-malware as I record. Gee, it's been a while uh, since I've heard of. Yeah, am I, am I, am I wrong on that? Uh, did yeah, kills CUDA drive, CUDA drive, and cloud copy uh, storage services. So yes, so it is them. I, I was wrong. I was right about that. Um, uh, I'm I'm looking at a story here on the register from February fourth, twenty sixteen, that talks about that. Anyway, so so one of the arguments people say is like, you know, well, what happens to you know what happens to all this. You know all this stuff that you thought was safe when your cloud storage company goes down. Um, you know I'd like to think it, it's hard to imagine in 2016 after everything that's happened that Amazon, uh, Amazon's cloud will just suddenly disappear, or that Google's cloud will suddenly disappear, or that Dropbox for that matter will suddenly disappear. First of all, uh, even if Dropbox, you know, if Dropbox was having problems, and you know, Dropbox is, is, is everywhere, but if they were, somebody would just scoop them up. Why? Because why would you just let something like that flounder? I mean, uh, it's it, it's hard to imagine that this stuff will disappear. And then people say, so you should always have a local backup. Well, you have a local backup on what? You have a local backup on DVDs and CDs. They're only rated for a certain number of years as well. You're going to store it on a hard drive on your local NAS? That's great, but hard drives crash. There is a mean uh, time to failure on those things. To quote uh, John Travolta's character uh, in the, when the movie Michael, and that was nothing ever less. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? Wow, that's really a stretch. But <laughs> <laughs> Wait, we're talking about Mesopotamia. He was talking about Mesopotamia, and he said, well, that city isn't around anymore. He said, ah, nothing ever less. That's true. It doesn't. Uh, but but the thing is, though, we I mean, we have to be able to think in terms of I mean, if if we're going to think in terms of human civilization going forward into you know, however far into the future, I mean, none of us none of us is living to consider that you know everything is just going to get swept away you know in the next ten years or something like that. We're living with the idea that things are going to continue. At least most of us are. You know, uh, some religious fundamentalist aside, I suppose. Well, did I say that? <laughs> But, but the idea that you could store a frightening amount of data, okay, on a small, tiny storage that could last literally billions of years that will not degrade over time, um, is just freaky amazing. And of course, that this is—I uh, mean, this applies to every operating system that we work with out there. Whether you're a Linux person or a Windows person, we're living in a world where we accumulate and generate incredible amounts of data. You know, uh, like when I was a kid. I mean, Ben doesn't remember this, but <laughs> <laughs> when you were a kid, yeah, yeah, that was. A few yeah, years. you don't remember. <clears throat> you don't remember this, but I know that Craig remembers the time when when taking pictures was actually expensive. Yeah, you had a camera. And you bought film for it, and you you know it was like twelve exposures or maybe twenty four. You know, and later as high as thirty six. Oh my and god! And then you took the pictures, and then you sent them away to be developed. Yes, printed. I, I did that. You know, did that. you remember that? You remember that? So yeah. you sent them away and stuff like that. So you were careful because it was expensive. You were careful about what pictures you took, and you generally took them at family events or whatever. Now you're walking down the street, and it's like, oh, that's a cool knot on that tree, and you take a picture of it. Why? Because you've got endless storage, and it all just gets uploaded into the cloud. Anyway, oh, look at that rock, and there's a bug crawling on it. I'm going to take a picture of that and post it on Instagram. Oh, Why? Because look, you can. 
and there's a police officer beating a civilian. Now let me let me take a picture of that. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> <laughs> Oop! We're gonna we're gonna call this the politically incorrect show when oh. I'm on. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean the point is the cameras are everywhere and they, they're everywhere, and, and people and, and people are being held accountable for their actions uh, because everything is being documented. Uh, and and it's cheap to document. It's cheap yes. to document that kind. You know, to 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 create that much media, to create that much video, YouTube, uh, like I said, Instagram, Twitter. You know, every social network, whether it's Facebook, Google Plus. But you know, pictures, 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 videos constantly. Yes. Frightful amounts of it. You know. So how do you preserve that stuff? You know. Um, and most of us, I like. Do we want to? <laughs> well, you know, you know, if you're the one taking the pictures. Yeah. Uh, or creating the videos, there's probably some part of you that thinks, you know, you know, Snapchat aside here, uh, there's probably some part of you that thinks, you know, I, I want to preserve this. You know, someday. Mm -hmm. We're going to go back and want to take a look at the pictures of grandma, you know, that sort of thing. Okay. You know, and, but you'd, you'd like to be able to think in terms of being able to preserve it. And right now, most of us, <clears throat> and I'm not picking out any particular person, I'm just saying most of us, society, um, is relying on the cloud for that. We, we are pretending that that's our secondary backup. That's our big, giant secondary backup. And most and of us don't have a local backup. Yeah, and, and as you say, even magnetic storage, optical media, there's really nothing that will store it for a, a long period of time. And we come back, we're going to be talking about a storage method that claims to do just that. Uh, we're at the bottom of the hour, we're going to take a little break, and then we'll continue on. Marcel Gagné is here with us for both hours. Looking forward to uh, this story and many more. We have a new Sis Pulse review from Marty Winston also coming up. Uh, this is the Computer America Show. We will be right back. Please stay with us. Sometimes, disaster strikes. Data can be lost due to many different reasons. Accidental reformatting, power spikes, virus attacks. Zero Assumption Recovery provides a suite of highly effective and thorough data recovery software for Windows operating systems. ZA is suitable for home users and small businesses who need a powerful data recovery solution for Windows and Linux file systems. Go to z-a-recovery.com. Sometimes, disaster strikes. Data can be lost due to many different reasons. Accidental reformatting, power spikes, virus attacks. Zero Assumption Recovery provides a suite of highly effective and thorough data recovery software for Windows operating systems. ZA is suitable for home users and small businesses who need a powerful data recovery solution for Windows and Linux file systems. Go to z-a-recovery.com. Hi, this is Craig Crossman, host of the Computer America Show. You have important meetings to schedule, your company's getting ready for its IPO, and you're in charge of the PTA fundraiser this month. So how do you coordinate everyone to be available at the same time? Are you still using emails, phone calls, even text messages to schedule meetings with a group of people? How's that working out for you? <laughs> That's so great, huh? It's a fact that every day, millions of people suffer from scheduling headaches. Well, with Doodle, scheduling meetings with a group of people is quick and easy. With Doodle, you can easily propose available times to each member. Each one checks off the times that they are available, and then you simply pick the time that works best for the group, all in an easy-to-read display that integrates with your existing calendar. Nothing could be more simple. Give Doodle a try for free, and like millions of Doodle users, you'll truly see how easy it is to find the perfect date and time for all your meetings. That's www.doodle.com. The wedding? No, they were rehearsing the honeymoon. Marty Winston with a News Tips Bulletin Review for Computer America. This time, CADsoft and Visioneer 11 Pro Architect Software. Designing and building our editorial project house was almost easier than documenting it until CADsoft sent Envisioneer 11 Pro Architect purpose-built CAD software for building things roughly house size, from pole barns to light commercial buildings. We got a head start for the AutoCAD files from our designer, to which we're adding walled and roof textures, 
major brand appliances, and a lot more. Once populated, we can generate all manner of renderings, including cutaways, exploded views, and again, lots more. Bottom line, the CanSoft Envisioneer 11 Pro Architect software is for our needs a great way to show how a house comes together by letting us visually take it apart. Marty Winston, News Tips Bulletin for Computer America. Well, welcome back to the Computer America Show. We are doing our all Linux show today. This is uh, both hours with Marcel Gagne. And yeah, we are just about to get into this uh, first story about memory that, uh, you know, I'm just going to tie in. If nothing else, it's a very, very interesting piece of technology. And, you know, uh, I just want to say that, not to brag, but I remember my phone number for about 15 seconds after I look it up. So, you know, <laughs> how useful this is going to be for the everyday person, questionable. But, uh, Marcel, please, uh, 360 terabytes of data for 14 B -b -b billion years? Yeah, which is, yeah, and the universe, for the record, is around 14 billion years. So, no, it's just a baby. Just yeah, a baby. it's just a baby. So, you know, uh, it, it will survive, in theory, the, uh, you know, it's, I, I suppose there's, uh, <clears throat> never mind being able to store it that long, but just, you know, just the idea that there is something that uh, has a life expectancy storage life expectancy that and by the way this is this is a, uh, a technique using a laser light on on structured quartz nano structured quartz it's I, um, I want to know that if it only lasts for 13 billion can, can I back get my money back perhaps who knows but do you remember did, did you read the Asimov foundation stories you know Years when ago. You were a kid? Yes. yeah when you're a kid um, you know the idea of being able to preserve human knowledge beyond, you know, just one generation is is in itself very, very exciting. Um, you, you talked about Mesopotamia, you know, but there are tablets, there are stone tablets from Mesopotamia that are still around and still readable. Mm. Um, and you've got books from 50 years ago that the paper is falling apart and it's just, you know, I mean, it just crumbles into dust when you pick it up. Um, it's in some ways kind of amazing that we took this turn uh, to very ephemeral you know uh, storage media um, and the idea that we might actually be turning the page and being able to preserve you know human knowledge for sure. generations is exciting very so how, so continue how do they do this I mean what's what's the story with the memory itself it's a new quartz coin well, they show it as a coin in the picture. Um, you know, they they they've got this little tiny uh, thing that looks about the size of a silver dollar or whatever. Did you guys ever actually adopt the silver dollar down there? Like, did you ever actually adopt a dollar coin? Yeah, the uh, Susan B. Anthony coin. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, but you guys never actually. You guys didn't like it for some reason. Though. Yeah, we no, saw people like paper. <clears throat> people like paper, I guess. Yes, people like it's paper. Still it's still but around. yeah, what they what they do is they include they they encode this this. You know, I mean, it's it's it uses nanotechnology to create, uh, you know, a, a especially encoded quartz crystal, and then they use a laser to encode um, the information inside the quartz crystal. So this is, I suppose, you could say it's a very much read-only memory. Um, and uh, the the final note, which is really really cool on here, is the idea that you know the quartz can withstand temperatures up to 157 degrees Celsius or 350 degrees Fahrenheit. So you could practically cook the damn thing and still have it survive. So, so, so I'm, looking, I'm looking at a picture of it. This one says Holy Bible. So I, yeah. <laughs> I thought it was fascinating that that was somehow, you know, the thing that, they, you know, put the fr freaking Encyclopedia Britannica, you know, the sum total of human knowledge. Oh, man, my, my atheist roots are really showing on the show. Yeah, here. <laughs> so what, maybe, uh, am maybe I... Maybe they're going to the, the irony route of here's the latest and greatest technology that's going to take us... And we're going to burn the Bible on it. Here's yes. the Bible. Well, you know, well, the, Bi the Bible is actually a good representation in the sense that it's 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 a it's a it's a big bloody book. Um, I you know uh, speaking as the resident atheist here, uh, I actually uh, <laughs> I actually have multiple copies of the Bible here. I'm fascinated by religion, uh, and and I mean truly truly fascinated by religion, uh, this, despite you know what I may not think of it. Um, uh, I've studied it, read it. Uh, I'm I'm one of the few people I know who's actually read the Bible more than once, cover to cover, uh, in in more than one translation. Um, I, I'm just totally, completely fascinated by it. But it's it's a big, bloody book, so it's actually a, a good representation of you know just how much data you can store. You know, store a big, giant book well, onto a tiny piece and keep it forever. All right. Well, here here's what I want to understand: uh, is this data? Because uh, I'm looking at images of it. Is the data itself um, 
encoded, or is it something that's so very, very tiny and it's it's human readable? You know, they're just inscribing human readable in very, very tiny format, uh, and there are actually little pages around there that you can read. I mean, how, how what what format is the data? Is is it binary information? Is it analog information that's being inscribed on there? What is it? You know? um, it's just information that's being inscribed on it. As as I understand it, it is not. I mean, they talk about it as encoded data. Okay. All okay. right. So so as I understand it, it's not just little tiny pictures that you can take yeah. a look at. It's like a micro dot or something. Yeah. Yeah. It's not like a micro dot. It's actually encoded information, which of course brings up you know before we walk away from this, as cool as this is, mm -hmm. okay, it brings up one other teeny tiny problem, What's which that? is. Bringing the technology into the future that will allow you to decode the information on it. Yes. Because if you've got if you've got like piles, let's pretend that somebody created. Oh, I don't know. I mean, uh, if you read the article, they talk about the idea of you know uh, storing uh, Newton's optics, the Magna Carta, the King James Bible, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the U.S. Constitution, you know, works that will outlive generations. Great, great. But what happens, you know, in uh, you know, in in mechanical for Leibowitz, you know, uh, <laughs> thousands of years later, when somebody picks up a shopping list and thinks, you know, and is trying to decipher what it actually meant, what happens when somebody comes upon a storehouse of these optical discs, these these sort of these quartz discs, and tries to figure out what they are, okay, and. And you know, I, they the look pretty. They look pretty. Maybe they're used for decoration. In other words, in other words, there's no way to read it. Uh, there'll be no way to read the uh, information off of it. Is what you're saying right now? What do you? What does it take to read the information off of it? Uh, some sort of a uh, device. Um, uh, how do you? How do you? How do you get the information off the disc right now? What uh, you? Well, presumably with a laser. The inf the way that you put it on. Okay. So you read it back out. Yeah, you read it back out. You decode it. Okay. Um, so that, that was a problem. Uh, some, you know, when, when they were finding traces of water on Mars, uh, you know, uh, the, first, the first little signs that there was, there was actually something real trapped there. And, quite, you know, and, of course, now we know that there are places where there are actually, there's actually liquid water at different periods of the year, you know, uh, when it's warm enough. Um, brine, briny, salty water. It's just, it's just salty enough that it doesn't freeze during that period. It rolls down the hills. So it's, it's kind of exciting with the thought of, you know, future colonization of Mars at some point. Um, but, but the, um, they went back to try to confirm some of that information. This is a few years ago, you know, be, before this was actually when they had the first tantalizing, you know, ideas that maybe there was something they thought. Let's go back and take a look at the Viking data. Mm-hmm. Okay, Viking is what 1970s, right? Uh, 75. Um, the the problem is that nobody knew how to read the stuff. You know, so you had you had these these big tapes, you know, filled with data from this probe that went to Mars, but nobody knew how to read it. So it's exciting. I mean, it's exciting in the sense that there's there's a you know there's potentially a way to store data for ridiculous periods of time, but we have to be able to somehow bring the knowledge into the future of how you pull that information back off of that stuff. At some what point. you can do is you can put a diagram and plans for the uh, device that's going to read it and put it on one of those little discs. So, <laughs> oh boy. Did you just labeling? <laughs> you know when they when they sent when they sent the um, when they sent the uh, the the disc the gold disc on the side of Voyager. <laughs> Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, the record on the side of Voyager. There were like, you know, number of scientists, you know, including you know the late great Carl Sagan, who were working together to try to figure out how do we send a message into space. Okay, because the disk actually is a record with information encoded. You can actually play the darn thing. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it's a record. You can play it. And you can hear the sounds of Earth. You know, music, animal sounds, songs. You know, all, yeah. you know uh, people speaking in a variety of languages and so forth. It's it's really really cool. Okay, but so you're sending this disk out. Somebody finds the probe. Oh, let's say you know three million years later, some alien comes across this thing. What do they do with it? They look at it and it's like, oh, pretty golden disc sitting on the side. So they they tried to come up with you know with some kind of a really base, simple encoded message on the side that would describe what the disc is, how it works, and for that matter, you know where it came from, who the people were that made it, and how to play it. You know, um, but it's were it's, they successful? <laughs> 
I don't know. As far as I know, no alien has picked up the disc and played uh, it yet. Okay. Uh, but they did. They they came with some very basic rudimentary. I think was it based on well, hydrogen or something. Yes, that. the hydrogen molecule, and you know, and then of course, uh, you know, uh, the, the, yeah, the base yeah. counting methods. They have a picture of the probe of the actual of the actual spacecraft beside a human male and female to give you an idea of scale of the beings that sent it out. Mm -hmm. You know. And uh, so I'm wondering if there's something like that for these glass uh, discs. If they're going to have something. I don't know. We'll have to find out. But it's 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 just cool. And and I wanted to touch on it because storage obviously is one of those things that that affects you know that sure. affects computer technology. All of us in computer technology, whether you're you know you're running Linux or Windows or or Mac, you know I mean it doesn't matter. It's right. it's one of those things. All right. So uh, I guess we move on to this next. Uh, uh, Russian hackers. Spying on your Linux PC. Yeah, this is actually one of the. I, I, I'm kind of fascinated by this one. I mean, there there were a couple of, of Linux uh, security stories that came out this week. The one that follows it is actually it has to do with glibc, which is the uh, the um, GNU uh, C library uh, on which a lot of it is built. Mm -hmm. And of course, I, I always have a little bit of trouble with that. It's like you know, it's a Linux flaw. It's not. I mean, glibc is a library used by. I mean, it's used in Macs. It's used, it's used everywhere. You know, it's it's not it's not a Linux thing. It's a library that happens to be shared on Linux systems. You know, among okay. countless other systems. Um, but but the flaw in the case of glibc is extremely difficult to exploit. Ridiculously difficult to exploit. Google posted a um, a proof of concept of how you go about doing it, and it's you know it's. By no means trivial. It's not. It's not the sort of thing that the average person could do it. And frankly, it would help if you had access to the computer to be able to do it. Fibsys is interesting because th this one has been reported. I don't know how many places I've seen this thing. Russian hackers spying on your Linux system, you know, in a sophisticated manner. It's like they're not just trying to steal your money. They're actually trying to take control and and use your system to spy on things and spy on other systems and so forth. Well, we've had worms and things like that for for you know a long long time but the fibsys story the reason i find it fascinating is it's it's been around since 2014 and then all of a you know so all of a sudden this week it's like you know in the last few days it's a story it's a big story all of a sudden mm -hmm. and um, for the as as a as an exploit you know, as a, um, you, it's, you know, right, rightly called a Trojan because, you know, it's something that lives on the system that somebody exploits remotely. Um, it requires basically a compromised system to begin with to install it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you have to be in a position so you, to be able to put the tools in place that will do all this malicious stuff. You already have to have a system that's been compromised in some way. Um, so they've had access to it uh, either through some other exploit uh, or whatever it is, but somehow I, I suppose it's the Russian hackers thing that you know that that's got you know all the attention because you know uh, was it was it last week or two weeks ago that uh, Russia said that America has relaunched the Cold War? I have not been following closely enough. I didn't hear anything about that. Yeah, yeah. There, 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 somebody in the Russian government uh, accused uh, the United States of of re. Uh, you know, reinvigorating or relaunching the Cold War. Hmm. So, um, so yeah, it was it was it was one of those pretty bold statements that uh, that you know you you know if you're if if you happen to hear it on the news, it was kind of hard not to notice because it's like, oh, great, Cold War. You know, um, I remember the Cold War. <laughs> so does Craig. So does Craig. Um, but uh, but yeah, so I, I suspect it has to do with the idea that you know it's uh, you know the Russians are infiltrating our systems, and that's why the story is getting a lot of press, despite the fact that this is you know in some ways really old news, but it's everywhere. Everybody's reporting it, so I thought I'd mention it. Um, it is important, to, obviously. It doesn't matter whether you're running Linux or Windows or whatever. Uh, Linux is is a far more secure operating system. It always has been, but uh, but as Craig pointed out at the beginning of the show, uh, Linux is everywhere now. You know, uh, it's uh, Linux is your Android phone. It's the Chromebook that I'm using to, you know, I, I've got two computers sitting here, but the one I'm actually using to uh, to do the uh, Hangout, to, to do the show right now, is actually a Chromebook. Um, it's everywhere. So it's, uh, there's a lot more Linux to go after than there ever was in the past. And uh, and it's important that we think about it. You know that we that we think about security in the Linux world. That we can't just say, you know, oh, it's that much more secure. We shouldn't worry about these things and so forth. There was another one where uh, there was some exploit uh, just recently where other hackers basically took it upon themselves to patch the security hole. 
So you had somebody who exploited, this is again in the Linux world, somebody exploited a security hole that existed and somebody wrote a patch that took advantage of the fact that the security wall was there and then went out and patched the systems that were out there. So, <laughs> so you've got this weird sort of battle going on between you know, the, uh, the black hats and the white hats and I suppose you could call the ones that, that fix your systems without you asking for it as gray hats. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've I've definitely heard of viruses that go out there and actually, you know, for, force your computer to download the the you know the proper patch to fix itself, and then it deletes itself after the whole thing. So yeah, like that 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 happens rarely, very rarely. It's it's kind of interesting. Um, it's it's scary and uh, and fascinating, I suppose, at the same time. I mean, I I, I don't like the idea that somebody is going to lie. You know, even if they're helping me. You know, um, and if you've done it, you know, leave me a note. <laughs> <You know? laughs> leave me a note. Uh, I, you know, I, I kind of don't like the idea that that happens. I, I, in a sense, it's, it's. I suppose you could think of it as a, um, as a uh, high tech version of vigilante justice. Yeah. You know, the lone vigilante out there who's going to go out and protect you, whether you want to be protected or not. <laughs> wow. And and, and yeah. You know, uh, you know, Craig with his Mac, me with my Windows, you, I'm sure, Marcel, with your both or either. But, uh, you know, we let our OS distributor do the exact same thing on a weekly basis. Well, well we do because, you know, let's be honest. I mean, uh, it, it, it really doesn't matter what you run. The, the, I, I mean, you guys, you guys are experts with the systems that you work with, and so am I. And, uh, but we can't expect the average person, even even the average person who's into computers, you know, to some degree, to to be able to keep track of every darn thing that runs on their system. And, and a system is not just an operating system with a kernel, you know, uh, or, you know, in, in old Windows parlance, you know, for the people out there who run Windows, the command.com file. That's not all it's about anymore. It's not just about the kernel. It's not, it's about all this other software that runs on it that is... That, that makes an operating system useful, you know, whether it's your word processor, whether it's the web server, you know, the email package, uh, the file sharing service that you've got. I mean, all those things are part and parcel of what a useful system is. So it's not just about, you know, the, the core operating system anymore. It's, it's about every other thing that runs on it. And most people can't be expected, even experts can't be expected to keep track of, you know, thousands of packages. No, I, I, I agree. I'm, I'm very forgiving that way. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, so where do we stand at this point? So, all right, the Russians. Let's just talk about the Russians one more time, okay? Uh, okay. Oh, those Russians. <laughs> so, so the Russian government. I, I, I posted a link to this one. Why Russia might switch all their government computers to Linux? They're talking about just you know passing an edict saying that all government computer systems will now run Linux. Okay, Whether it happens or when it happens is another matter, but they, they've, they've said this. They've announced that this is what they're doing. And apparently, it's, it's in, this, the subtext of it, which is kind of funny, is that it's not because it's technically superior or safer or anything like that. They're doing it to piss off American companies, you know, notably Microsoft. <laughs> So, so they're talking about switching to, to Linux, in in for what I think of, and and right, I'm I'm a Linux guy. When I you know I think everybody should be running Linux on the desktop, but to me somehow this is the wrong reason. <laughs> I just want to piss off the American companies, so we're gonna we're gonna switch to you know we're gonna switch to Linux. That's the reason we're doing it. That's the real reason we're doing it. I, it, is that the? I, I mean, uh, it kind of makes sense because you know, even here on the show, we've interviewed uh, companies that are actually based in Russia, and you know, who who provide uh, you know digital security, and it's it's always weird hearing about companies who uh, come from Russia because Russia does have that uh, does have that reputation that's you know maybe not the most secure things that Russians do. But they're good at getting into other secure places. So well, I mean, they're also the only ones that have a spaceship that can get to the international space station right now. So I mean, you got you got to give them something here. That's fair. That's fair. Uh, well, and you know they they explode every so often, but you know uh, risk of the job, risk of the job. Um, but I 
I guess Russians just proven that they can get into places and do things, and there seems to be a pretty lively ring of uh, of sharing of stolen credit cards and stuff. I mean, even you know, e- even my own dear mother was compromised by the Russians uh, for her card. So oh, uh, those Russians. Yeah, I, I, I mean, you know, it's. That's, that's the end of Boney M. Rasputin, by the way. At the end of the song, they go, oh, those Russians. So, anyway. Never, <laughs> no, but it, it makes complete sense that, you know, the Russians, if, if, if they're, you know, assuming they are Russian state-sponsored uh, or just Russians, you know, bored because it's snowing 18 feet every day. Um, <laughs> it's it, not it, snowing it, everywhere it, in Russia. I want to point that out. <laughs> That's just like it's Russia's not huge. everywhere in Canada all the time. Russia's huge. Uh, th- that's it is. Terrible. It is. It's well. It is. It is the. Uh, you know. It's. It's the biggest country in the world mm-hmm. I mean, in terms of land mass and land area. Even after the breakup of the Soviet Union, it's still the biggest country in the world. It's so. Very dang big. But it would make sense for for you know if if someone's gonna look for security uh, threats, obviously they've uh, diverted their attention from flash uh, flash media because you know everyone's decrying the downfall of that. Uh, so they move on to Linux based stuff. So makes sense. Well yeah, or or you know, whatever's whatever's lucrative. Let's uh, um, one of the things that uh, i I remember having this explain you know when my parents were would say, you know, why do people do that? You know, why 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 are people trying to break into systems? Why why do people steal your credit card information? You know, why do people you know, it's it's a business. You know, um, what what people forget is that you know when it's when all this when all of this stuff is said and done, illegal or otherwise, it's a business. These people are in it to make money, and this is how this is their business. Now, it's not a business model that's good for us, you know, for those of us who are trying to you know hold on to our money or keep our systems secure. But you know, we we have to stop thinking about it as uh, you know as a bunch of kids that are bored in the snow, you know, uh, breaking into systems. No, no, no. This is this is big business. You know, it's 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 international, you know, crime, and uh, and sometimes it's government sponsored. I mean, you know, you know, God forbid that you know uh, if any government in the world would actually ever be engaged in criminal activity. You know, <laughs> ours included. <laughs> <laughs> But but it happens, right? Know? Yeah, yeah. And, and a business, you know, isn't even about stealing the money from your bank account. They have this black market that goes on. That really, you can buy IP addresses of, of mm-hmm. open networks. You can buy, uh, you know, credit card credit card numbers by yeah. the hundreds. And you know, it, it, just selling the information alone without actually having to, you know, really do much to steal the information is yeah. is, is profitable. And, and 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 crime pays, you know. Uh, did you ever see the movie Johnny Dangerously? Do you remember the movie Johnny Dangerously? Anybody? Ah, uh, Greg might. I don't. Yeah. I loved that movie. You got to go look it up. That's, it's it's Batman, right? The guy played by what's his name? The um the actor. Michael Keaton. Michael Keaton. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. John, um, you know, uh, Johnny Dangerously was was a wonderful movie on. And I, I, can't tell you how many times I've watched it. I'm embarrassed to tell you how many times I've watched it. Uh, Joe Pesci was in it. Uh, it's it's just it's brilliant. It's like a brilliant movie, and there's this gangster who uh, swears all the time. But they kept it a G-rated movie <laughs> because he he swears constantly. But his swearing, they're they're all he he can't speak the language properly, so he says you know fatagin bastages. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Cork sucking ice hole. So, so at no point does he actually ever swear, because you know, ice hole, ice hole, cork sucking. You know, like it sounds, it sounds like he's swearing, but he's not really. So because of that, they managed to give it a G rating or a PG rating. I forget exactly what it was, but it's it's a wonderful movie. The reason I pointed out in relation to this, you know, it's amazing how often we go back to movies and TV shows on this show. But at the end of it, you know. Um, Johnny is is giving this. He's telling this whole story. He's working at a pet shop, and this kid has tried to steal a, a dog, you know, in his shirt. So he tells him this whole story about his life of crime. And at the end of it, he looks at the kid and he goes, "Remember, kid, crime doesn't pay." And he goes, "I'll remember that, Mister." And he, and then he says, "Here, you can keep the dog." And he ruffles his hair, and the kid walks out. And he takes off his coat, and under and under his white coat that he's working, he's got this expensive suit under the white coat. And he goes outside, and there's a limousine waiting for him. The chauffeur opens up the door, and his wife, all dressed up in furs and and jewels and so forth, and he's about to get in the car. And he turns and he looks at the camera. And he says, "Well, it paid a little." <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Okay. <laughs> we I, here at Computer America do not endorse crime. No, we, we do not. <laughs> no, we do not. We do not. So, so uh, obviously we're at the top of the hour, and and uh, I want to get oh, to. Oh man. Uh, yeah, I know. Uh, yet another Linux sort of security flaw that I want to talk about. But again, uh, uh, we, we can sort of get started on it, but we have less than two minutes. So. Uh, yeah. Why don't we get started on it, and then we'll we'll continue on. What what's with all the Linux security flaws showing up? You know, um, it, well, Linux is everywhere, so it's 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 interesting. But like I said, what's interesting about it is they're not necessarily Linux security flaws. I mean, we had security flaws on the last show. I was telling you about something that that infiltrated a particular content management system. And it wasn't even a popular content. I mean, it's popular in the sense that lots of people use it, but it's not one of the big ones. You know, it's not like a Drupal or a Joomla right. or, or a yeah. WordPress or something like that. But, but it, it provided a way for this thing to install itself and do stuff. So it's like, well, you know, it infiltrated Linux systems. Well, yeah, you know, in a really roundabout way. It's like, you know, it's... It, it's kind of hard for me to beat up on, like even in the Windows world, you know, it's like, well, you know, a security flaw in Microsoft Excel. Was that really a problem with the operating system or is that a problem with Excel? You know, it's like, you know, so, so yeah, Linux is kind of everywhere. So it's not surprising that, that, you know, we're, we're seeing a number of those stories. And of course, as there are less and less, let's be honest, as there are less and less Windows servers, uh, out on the internet. I mean, are there any Windows servers on the internet these days? Uh, it's, it's practically all Linux. Uh, it's not surprising that that would be the vector for you know whatever it is that uh, you know people are trying to do out there. So that doesn't really surprise me. No. All right. Well, listen, we're going to take a, a quick top of the hour break, and we're going to continue on. Uh, Marcel Gagné is our Linux expert. We're doing Linux shows again. You can follow along uh, with our cheat notes. Uh, Six more weeks of winter is the title of them. Uh, we're going to just break momentarily, and then we'll be back. We have another news to to review uh, from Marty Winston. That's all coming up on Computer America. Stay with us. We're going to be right back just in a moment. I promise. Broadcasting live, it's the only national radio talk show on computers to air every weeknight. Computer America, hosted by national columnist Craig Crossman. The first hour's behind us, but there's still more of tech news, tech talk, and your phone calls. We're being beamed nationwide at ComputerAmerica.com. You got computer problems? Bring them on. You're listening to Computer America. Computers run the world, and we run computers. Call us or send us an email to live at ComputerAmerica.com. Hello and welcome into Hour 2 of the nation's longest-running nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers. This is the Computer America Show, and I'm your host, Craig Crossman. And I'm your co-host, Ben. And uh, we're in our all I'm that other guy. Yeah, all Linux show with Marcel Gagné, our Linux correspondent. And again, you can follow along uh, uh, with everything we're talking about on today's show. Well, most everything. We, we get sidetracked. But, you know, just go to ComputerAmerica.com, go to today's show. There's a link there that says Cheat Notes, and uh, you can click on that. It'll open up a Google Docs document, and you can see all the stories we're talking about, including links to the stories. And uh, uh, it's just another way for you to follow along. And you can do this whether we're live or whether you're listening to the show archived. Uh, just go to ComputerAmerica.com. Everything is there waiting for you. Um, so we were, we were sort of like a, talking about Linux flaws or security flaws. Uh, we were talking about Russian hackers before, and now we're talking about this uh, security flaw for Linux, sort of. And, um, and uh, where, are, where do we stand? Do you, do you want to continue on with that? You know, no, not really. I mean, I wanted to point it out because they're, yeah. they're you know, I mean, anything that's security related is, is important. And if you're yeah. running a Linux server in particular, um, you know, that's facing the world, uh, that's providing services to the world, then you want to be paying attention to those sorts of things. Yeah. Um, if you're running Linux on the desktop at home, you know, honestly, you're probably still running the most secure operating system you possibly can. I mean, you're not going to, you're not going to get viruses. You're not going to have, um, I mean, pretty much nothing's going to happen to you if you're running Linux on the desktop at home. And yes, I've got another article on Linux uh, world domination. I'm not even going to go into it other than the fact that it was yet another story about, you know, uh, Linux des you know, world desktop domination and, okay. and somebody decrying the idea that Steam Steam, which uh, provides uh, you know Linux software to run its games, mm -hmm. um, and uh, by the way, I'm playing uh, Beyond Earth and uh, Civilization 5 on Steam at the moment. 
you know my 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 Steam nod. Um, but um, it's uh, you know, he points out that the Steam adoption for Linux specifically is, you know, like 1% or something like that. And that means that, you know, Linux is never going to dominate on the desktop. And, you know, I, I basically say, does it really matter? I mean, like I said, Linux is kind of everywhere. Does it really matter? I mean, there are those of us who will continue to run desktop operating systems. Um, right. Even when everybody else in the world is running... Uh, uh, you know, basic web front-end stuff. Like Microsoft has their equivalent of a Chromebook now. Well, here's the thing. Speaking of Microsoft, according to this next article that you have, Russia might switch thousands of government computers to Linux. In spite no, no, no. We were, yeah, we were just talking about that. Sorry, sorry. I, sorry. I, I guess I jumped into that story right, from a previous... Microsoft. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I, I want to do that. So like, so continue on, please. Yeah, So, so... So even if that's the case, you know, desktop domination, maybe not. Uh, let's just move down the news. Zombie time. I say zombie time because <laughs> you remember when Sco decided to sue Linux and then said they were going to sue all Linux users? And then there were a bunch of people out there, myself included, who basically publicly posted something on their pages that said, go ahead, Sco, sue me. You know, sue all of us for running Linux. Ha, 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 ha. Well, those guys never die. But apparently... If you if you read this article in the yeah. uh, in the register, Who their else? last two arguments, if that's even possible after all these years of them being dead and gone, mm -hmm. you know, I remember when Sco was one of the good guys. This is how long ago we're talking here, okay. but but their last two arguments supposedly have now been thrown out. So theoretically, after all these years, yeah, Sco may finally be dead. <laughs> <laughs> So just thought I'd point it out. Security, there's a new release of Firefox that affects absolutely everybody, whether you're running Windows or Linux or whatever. It's not a, it's not a huge release. Um, I mentioned that because I saw a story about the other, you know, the other, um, the other uh, browser, desktop browser. And um, there are a couple of, like, in the Linux world, we actually have a lot of browsers. I don't know about, you know, over on the Mac. I'm not entirely sure. I mean, on the Mac, they probably run mostly Opera. Uh, not Opera, rather, but um, uh, help me out. What's the what's the Mac browser? Um, oh, uh, uh, oh uh, Safari. 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 Thank you, Safari. Safari. Uh, Opera. Safari. I can see why I made a mistake. Anyway, Safari. Uh, but in the Linux world, we've got like a variety of text-only browsers. We've got Lynx, Elynx. We've got uh, W3C. We've got uh, L-I-N-K-S, L-Y-N-X. Uh, there's all these text-only browsers. If you basically wanna, if you wanna surf the web really, really fast, so Linux does provide you with a huge, huge number of browsers, uh, including the biggies, obviously. Uh, uh, you know, we, we run Google Chrome. There's a version of it that's the, open, the completely open source version of Chrome called Chromium, which uh, you can run on a Linux desktop. Uh, and of course, Firefox, which, like I said, uh, as I mentioned, uh, has a security release. Uh, it's, it's a minor release, but it is a security release, so again, it's important. Um, but I'm... And uh, one of the ones that I have been playing with a bit lately uh, from um, Vivaldi is another browser that uh, I've been playing with lately, which is, uh, to me, looks uh, very promising and, um, you know, one that people might want to take a look at. But the other browser that people have been using for years, again, also in the Linux world, is um, Opera. And uh, Opera was this you know, modern browser that was available for Linux in the early days. So it was, you know, it had a, a, a following that was actually quite um, loyal. You know, it had a small, loyal following in the Linux world. Um, by the way, if you do want to check out Vivaldi just for fun, it's Vivaldi.com, V-I-V-A-L-D-I.com. If you want to check out a browser that you may not have seen before, uh, right. that's, that's well worth checking out. Uh, check that one out. But the reason that what's, what's interesting about Opera, Opera had incredible multi-platform support uh, and in fact it was one of the first browsers that you could get like on mobile devices you know when when you were wondering when you were ever going to get a decent browser on your mobile device you know on your on your small s phones when they were just starting to be smartphones opera was available now opera is a norwegian company um, and uh, again they've been around for a long long time but they just got bought out by the chinese here we go with you know uh, uh, foreign powers that we question how you know we 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 question their involvement, you know, the government involvement. When, sometimes. When did that happen? 
Uh, when did that happen? It just happened. It happened a few days ago. Uh, uh, yeah, I, 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 they're, they're, as I said, they're, they're friends of the show. They, they've been on, uh, you know, multiple times. Oh, have they? Have they? Yeah, yeah I love they, Opera. Opera has, Opera has been. I mean, it's one of those. It's one of those browsers. I mean, I. It's crazy, but I use a lot of browsers, um, and uh, probably because I have access to a lot of browsers. But it's amazing mm -hmm. over the years how many browsers I have used. I know that if you run Windows and possibly if you run Mac, you always just run the same thing. Period. Right. You know, in the Linux world. Maybe because we've got so much at our disposal, we have so many, uh, you know, options. Um, I, and I know I'm not the only one who does this. I, I run multiple browsers, and again, Opera is one of them. But they just got bought out by a consortium of Chinese companies for 1.2 billion dollars. Good for them. Okay. Wow. Very yeah, cool. And, and you know, uh, when they were on the show, they 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 always liked the fact that. Um, you know, don't get me wrong. I'm sure if they could, they would love to have a 60% market share or whatnot. <laughs> but they really didn't mind having you know that one to two to three to four percent market share because you know they they mentioned that a lot of what they do is research and development, and their user base knows that. And what they do, you know, usually winds up in the other browsers after a year or two. So I guess you know a Chinese company saw the value. In their research department, and you know, shelled out a nice chunk of change for it's, uh, new technology. Yeah, no, you know, I, I admire that. I didn't know that they said that. You know, you said they said that on the show. The idea that they're okay with the small. I, I admire that because I, you know, I, I always question this idea that we have to be number one. That there's no room for you know number ten or eleven or something like. It. It's just nuts. It's mm -hmm. just nuts because. Um, that number 10 or 11 can drive the entire marketplace. And again, let's talk about Linux, you know, desktop Linux. Um, you know, the, the little operating system that, you know, wasn't ever going to be worth anything is now basically running the Internet. You know, uh, runs, you know, finances, runs uh, supercomputers that, that do Hollywood blockbusters and so forth. So there is there is an opportunity for something that you think of as an outlier because the outlier might actually be what drives innovation. So, you know, um, I admire Opera's, uh, you know, philosophy that way. Right. Um, one of the reasons I, uh, that this is particularly noteworthy is that we get back to the whole notion of security, okay? When BlackBerry here in uh, Waterloo uh, there was actually a consortium of Chinese companies a couple of years ago that were looking, that were basically, you know, checking out the waters, talking about buying it. And the Canadian federal government blocked it. Mm. Okay. And they blocked it because BlackBerry is used by security agencies, it's used by governments and stuff like that. They have this hyper secure communication network. And they have a huge patent portfolio of hyper secure communication stuff that, again, is being used by government security agencies. You know, uh, you know, Barack Obama walking around with his BlackBerry. You know, even today, that sort of thing. Um, it's it was very important, and they felt it was very important to make sure that it stayed out of you know of, out of foreign powers. You know, that that were questionable. <laughs> You know, from our perspective, anyway. So one of the first things that Opera had to do was put out a statement, basically trying to reassure its user base that security was not going to be compromised as a result of their acquisition by Chinese interests. So, so, hmm. so I I found that fascinating. It's like you know, hey, we just got bought up for 1.2 million or 1.2 billion. Great. But we got bought up by the Chinese, so now we need to reassure everyone that you know their data is still safe and secure. And is it? <laughs> well, the statement that they put out is we're a Norwegian company. Yeah. Uh, despite the fact that our ownership is now Chinese, uh, we are still bound by Norwegian laws, and uh, those laws take personal privacy very seriously. So none of that will change, um, you know. But you know, we've had Opera on the show numerous times, and uh, as uh, and you'll have to ask them about that when you get them on again. I guess we will. Uh, it, they're about due. We haven't had them on for a little bit, so uh, we should probably get them back on. Yeah, especially hear, since this they, is big news. Yeah, I'm sorry, Ben. I hear I hear they've been busy being bought. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, exactly, exactly. 
and, and you know they're they're definitely great guests, and you know, and, and really it, you can't understate just how much they do for browsers in general. I mean, they were the first one to come up with tabs. They were the first one to other things that I don't recall off the top of my head. Well, like I said, they were the first ones to offer you know a, a decent solid browser for right. you know mobile devices. Yeah, they, they they definitely do a lot, and it. it I, I think you're you're right. It, it's a little strange that people would consider just the sale would compromise everything that the company has, you know, kind of held their standards to. But um, that's traditional. I mean, people, that, people are suspicious. Yeah, that's traditional. Well, I don't yeah. think is. Anytime a company is being bought by a larger company or, or another company, the first thing that springs to mind is, uh, oh, panic. are they? Gonna, yeah, panic. Are they going to be able to keep, you know? Uh, all the good things about it, are they going to, uh, is this new company uh, that's taking over going to inject their philosophies into whatever it is and kind of ruin the product? Uh, are they gonna, are this they, is fair. You know, we, we, we've definitely seen that with other products. Yeah. Or yeah, people want to know what, what's going to change. How does this affect me? Yeah, well, now when I run my yeah. opera, everything be in, you know, in Mandarin. You know, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, you wonder about things like that, you know, and, and, uh, and uh, if they, or if they're going to maintain a hands-off policy. Most well, you know, it, but but it's a valid question. It's a valid question, and I'm not and I'm not picking on Opera here because this this happens all the time yeah. when a company gets bought by another company. What's the first thing that the new owners say? Nothing will change. It's the very first thing out of their mouths. Yeah. yeah, it's the very first thing out of their mouths. Nothing will change. This will not affect how you know how you work with this or how this happens or whatever and six months down the road you realize that it was all a lie you know right. um, it happens all the time I mean it's 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 classic it's classic yeah, exactly uh, nothing will change except the name of opera will be said backwards it will be now known as Arepo or something <laughs> you know? nah, somehow I don't think so Lenovo Lenovo you know as is, is an example you know IBM the IBM uh, PCs I mean, to this day, there are still some of us who think of them as IBM PCs, even though they clearly say Lenovo on them. Yeah. You know, you think of them as the ThinkPads, and who makes ThinkPads? IBM. Yeah. Um, but they did. A, that was a good job. They did a good job. They uh, did. I agree. I agree completely. And, but that's not always the case, you know. So. But they all they also inserted a root kit. Yeah. To their product a few years ago. Remember? Yeah, I heard about that. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh. Oh well, well. I want to know. I want to, We all want to know. We, we'll see. I guess we'll just have to wait and see if uh, if uh, any changes are forthcoming. Hopefully, uh, it only changes. Hopefully, will be good ones. <laughs> of course. <laughs> well, of course it will be. Don't be ridiculous. Well, all right. Shall we move on to distributions? Yes. We always talk about distributions on the yes. show. We need to talk about distributions, and because and, because there are like lots of them. Yeah, we've we've talked about so many really cool and sometimes whacked out distributions. Uh, these are basically distribution is uh, a presentation of Linux that may have a certain um, uh, direction. In other words, it might have a certain feature, like like uh, a version of Linux that's designed for programmers or a version of Linux yep. designed for you know to. Uh, to be embedded into you know motorcycles or something you know you, know, <laughs> you have all these these strange distributions but basically uh, distribution is some group or company or or, or decides to uh, put their own um, tag on it and 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 modify it in some way to make it either better worse or or just different or sometimes <laughs> just suitable to their own particular purpose you know their That's own right. organization's purpose right. And, and we can do that in the Linux world because yeah. Linux is freely distributed and you're allowed to do whatever you want with it. Yeah. This is not like Windows distribution. You can't do that because Windows is owned all solely by Microsoft. So Funny you should say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that segue. I know. <laughs> Thank you for that segue. You know, I... I, I haven't done this too often in my life, um, but you know how on April 1st, some you know it's a thing now. Like you, you, you don't even want to log on to the internet. You don't even want to get on the internet on August on the sorry on April first because you can't trust anything you read. That's all right. <laughs> and and normally, but yeah, exactly. You can't. You can't. And I remember. I remember uh, a few years ago. Um, and this this is what our next story is about. Well, it's not what our next story is about, but it leads into the next story. I remember posting a story that Microsoft. 
uh, was unhappy with the development of this particular operating system and they saw it as competition and uh, they were offer you know and, and I tried to fight it but because it was open source they wound up you know they, they were going in and buying the company and I, I I made up some number like six billion dollars I forget what it was you you can you can probably search on Marcel Gagne uh, uh, Microsoft buys react OS and um, and I cannot tell you the hundreds and hundreds of comments that that came from this article like it was read thousands of times and people were just you know were were upset and livid about it and stuff like that and even though even despite the fact that people were pointing out guys please look at the date <laughs> <laughs> look at the date marcel is trolling you and i don't generally do this i think i've only maybe done it once or twice over the years uh, but this one was highly successful, and it just—it sounded so incredibly plausible that um, that uh, people bought it. But there is a distribution out there, and I, it's weird for me to call it a distribution because while everybody was trying to create a Linux distribution that had a look and feel of Windows in the early desktops, mm -hmm. okay, modern desktops, people have long since said, you know hell with it you know we're 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 creating our own desktop environment you've got plasma kde plasma uh, you know the, the super slick bleeding edge you know gorgeous desktop uh, you know doesn't it doesn't look anything like windows it doesn't matter you've got uh, you've got unity the uh, gnome desktop uh, you know doesn't look like windows we don't care that it doesn't look like windows but early on there was this attempt to to you know if we're gonna get if we're gonna get people adopting Wind Linux desktops in a big way we have to sort of make it easy for them so we're gonna try to you know we're gonna try to give them a, a Windows sort of feel you know to the desktop so they don't feel like they're you know they're you know walking into a foreign country and they can't speak the language mm -hmm. but we we don't care about that now but so years ago there was this little operating system where they decided to take a different approach this here we go with the Russians. <laughs> Because <laughs> this guy's a Russian, I uh, decided to create something called React OS, and React OS was I'm going to recreate Windows from the ground up using only open source software. It's not going to be Windows, but I'm going to make it so that you can run Windows applications using you know the Wine libraries and stuff like that. It will look like Windows. It will feel like Windows. It'll have the the you know the look and feel the the, the same ornamentation. In fact, you're going to be able to load up your Windows software and run it, and it was interesting. I'm going to use the word interesting. It was interesting, but it was only, to be perfectly honest, so good. Um, and and it was a long way from from even running anything, to be perfectly honest. Um, and so, if you take a look, if you if you go and take a look at ReactOS.org, um, they haven't released anything for years. In fact, let me take a look at the uh, at the news here. Project news. When was the last time they released something before this one here? Uh, ba -da -ba -da -ba. Nearly 10 years ago. Right. Jeez. You know, today we're proud to announce the formal release of version 0.4.0. .0. So 10 years ago they had 0 0.3.0. And it's like this, this nothing for all this time. It's like it's just nothing. And then 0.4.0 .0 comes out. And uh, so I downloaded it and I installed it <laughs> and ran it. And um, it installing it feels like you're installing Windows NT. You know, remember Windows NT? Yeah. You yeah. know, or, or even Windows 2000. You know, because they're yeah. they're basically the same. Uh, that's what it feels like. It feels like you're running this this Windows Server operating system as you're loading it. Um, I I even took a bunch of screenshots. I was thinking that I might actually uh, do an article and post it on this, just because I'm kind of fascinated by what they've done with it. But if you go to ReactOS.org, and and again, it it. it feels like it everything about it you know it's like what's your name what's your computer name like all those prompts all those install prompts that you're used to seeing if you install Windows NT or Windows 2000 from back you know way back when they're all there <laughs> like, oh. it's just it's what the culmination when you finally installed it what happened um, it's it's kind of neat it it mostly works there's uh, you know it, it didn't really work at all before but it mostly works. There's a bunch of programs that actually do work now that do operate. Uh, interestingly enough, you can load up Opera, you know, the Windows version of Opera, since we mentioned Opera. Uh, if you go to ReactOS.org, there's a gallery, a screenshot gallery, where they they show you a bunch of things, you know. Uh, Solitaire. Uh, 
Yeah, if you, LibreOffice Writer, you know, obviously we've got the, but you know, they've got uh, the Windows version of Mozilla. Uh, they've got, uh, you know, uh, some Mario Brothers, <laughs> Adobe Photoshop, like all these, all these different applications, closed source, open source, that sort of thing, which which run under, you know, the the new version of React OS. So, it's it's yet another one of those things that you know you just thought was gone forever, and then suddenly it reappears, and uh, they've obviously done a lot of work. Um, since you know, since their last appearance. What, was, what do you think the impetus was? They said, "Oh, ten years have passed," or something. You know, I don't know. I suspect, you know, there's a there's a game that uh, there's an Android game I am a huge, massive, massive fan of. I absolutely love it. If you if you go and look at my YouTube channel, you'll see that I've got a couple dozen let's play sort of videos of it. Um, it's called Survival Craft. Survival Craft is an Android game. Uh, that takes its inspiration from um, from uh, Minecraft, obviously, you know, by the by the name. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's 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 different in so many different ways. First of all, the graphics are a lot you know are a lot slicker and cooler, despite the fact that we're still working with this block stuff. Uh, the premise is that there's a ship that drops you on an island with no food and no supplies. You don't know why the ship did this or why you're being abandoned, but you are. You are literally the lone person on there. When night falls, things will come to eat you. You know, so you need to make shelter quickly, and you need to find food. And unlike Minecraft, where you can last for you know several days without eating anything, okay, mm -hmm. in Survival Craft, you've got about a day and a half to find food. After that, you die. <laughs> it's it, the the it's you've got lions. There there aren't creepers and things like that. What you have are lions and tigers and bears and oh my, you know, and you know, and rhinos and 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 wolves that attack you at night. Like it's it, it feels really immediate and and much more realistic in a lot of ways, despite the fact that it's a sandbox sort of world. Well, the creator of Survival Craft, believe it or not. I haven't forgotten what we're talking about here. I'm tying this in to React OS. <laughs> the creator is uh, is this reclusive sort of guy. I mean, Survival Craft is not a small project. A lot. I mean, it, there are you know a few hundred thousand people that have downloaded Survival Craft. Um, but the guy is he just disappears every once in a while. You know, um, so he'll be in his forums and he'll be taking care of it and, you know, chatting with people. Uh, he goes by the name Kalus, K-A-A-L-U-S. Um, I don't know, maybe he's a Russian. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but but he, uh, he will just disappear and people are going like, you know, what happened? You know, is he dead? Uh, you know, uh, why isn't he replying to forum posts? Uh, why isn't he replying to, to this or that? But the game is so ridiculously compelling that people continue to play it. And and like I said, if you take a look on, um, I I have no idea how many people, uh, but on Google Play, uh, Google Play tells you how many people have downloaded. It's like you know a few hundred thousand. You know, um, it's 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 not a small project. It's not it's not a small game. I mean, it has a huge following. But you've got this reclusive sort of you know individual developer who just sort of disappears for long periods of time, and then will suddenly reappear with a brand new version that's got the all sorts of cool React things. React is the same way. Is what you're saying? You know, I I suspect that I suspect that there are a lot of projects out there like maybe, that where somebody maybe the builds really something, and then it's you know. They just disappear for a while and they continue to hack away at it. And when they're happy with how far they've come, however long this might take, mm -hmm. you know, they go, "Hi, look at what I've done lately." You might not remember me, because, <laughs> <laughs> but here it is. So anyway, so React OS. So for for the people out there who want to see an open source project that is not Linux, that is strangely enough look at, you know, that is strangely enough trying to be an earlier version of Windows. Remember what I said about NT and Windows 2000? We're not talking Windows 8 or Windows 10 here. We're talking like old Windows. All right. Okay. Check it out. Uh, I'm going to mention another one just very... Uh, are you ready to move on from this yes. one? Yes. Okay. Black labeling. Black Lab. Black Lab is... is, is I, I think of it as, as another Linux Mint sort of distributions. It's uh, I say like a big friendly dog, Black Lab Linux. It's 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 meant to be you know here here are here are all the things you need here are all your codecs you don't have to go and download anything else you don't have you don't need anything else here's this big friendly Linux distribution that that you can just you know boot up and run um, I installed it played with it a little bit it's it's nice it's it's but it's it's designed to be like Linux Mint um, you know one of those just big friendly distributions that just sort of takes you by the hand 
Okay. Um, the next one I want to touch on, and, uh, and I'm going to jump ahead of this one just briefly. If you're going out there and you're visiting all these sites and, and you want to try out these different distributions, because there are a lot of different ones out there, obviously you're going to download what's called an ISO1 image. Okay, it's a disk image, which you then burn to a disk, or not, because I want to cover something else in my, you know, uh, probably after the break, because I see we're coming close to the half hour here. Yeah. Um, but there's something called Linux Tracker, linuxtracker.org. Okay, and uh, I'll mention that one because for for the for the people who download torrent who download off torrent sites and so forth, torrents aren't all about you know uh, you know illegal software or uh, you know or rips of movies or something like that. That's that's not all it's about. Torrents are a really effective way to provide incredibly large files um, very very quickly. If people, you know, keep the torrent going and keep the distribution going, and um, I, I mention it because if you're downloading a Linux distribution, they can be quite huge. You can be talking to something the size of a DVD, you know, up to four gig in size. Might be a gig, might be a gig and a half, something like that. They can be pretty big files. And if you're downloading it directly, just doing an FTP download or an HTTP download from the site, that can take a while. I mean, I've had I've had disks that will download, you know, it'll be like 20, 25. I mean, I've got like a really, I've got Marcel, Ridiculous. sorry. Just just letting you know that uh, the LinuxTracker.org is not a good link because I do it and it comes up uh, Linux uh, link not found. So just letting you know. I'm there now. Okay. Well. L i n u x t r a c k e r dot o r g. Yeah. The, dot slash index. Uh, dot php. Slash index dot php. I don't know if you need the index dot php. Yeah. Exactly. Well, Linux, I'm fine. let me just do LinuxTracker.org. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just yeah. Just yeah. That works too. That works too. Yeah. LinuxTracker.org. And the index is like the first one on the yeah. Uh, menu. Yeah. Okay. I, I anyway, if you just go to LinuxTracker.org, it should work fine. Uh, I've just I've gotten there both ways, so it is theoretically possible. I don't I don't know what happened. Maybe your maybe your it's got to be my uh, uh, your my, Mac. It's your Mac. I blame no, your Mac. My ISP won't let me go to it. Ah. Very strange. Really? Yeah. Works for, works yeah. for me. Hey, we got to uh, I'm not getting it. All right. Well, we'll figure it out. In the meantime, we got a break, and we'll continue. Okay. This is the Computer America Show. It's our All Linux Show. Marcel Gagné continues with us. We'll be right back with him after this. Hi, this is Craig Crossman, host of the Computer America Show. You have important meetings to schedule. Your company's getting ready for its IPO. And you're in charge of the PTA fundraiser this month. So how do you coordinate everyone to be available at the same time? Are you still using emails, phone calls, even text messages to schedule meetings with a group of people? How's that working out for you? <laughs> That's so great, huh? It's a fact that every day, millions of people suffer from scheduling headaches. Well, with Doodle, scheduling meetings with a group of people is quick and easy. With Doodle, you can easily propose available times to each member. Each one checks off the times that they are available, and then you simply pick the time that works best for the group, all in an easy-to-read display that integrates with your existing calendar. Nothing could be more simple. Give Doodle a try for free, and like millions of Doodle users, you'll truly see how easy it is to find the perfect date and time for all your meetings. That's www.doodle.com. Looking for a best friend? Brother Wolf Animal Rescue has your best friend waiting just for you. The mission of Brother Wolf Animal Rescue is to help build a sustainable, no-kill community where no dogs or cats are ever killed for population control. Where true euthanasia is reserved only for animals who are irremediably suffering or for animals who are truly a threat to society and with no hope of rehabilitation. Brother Wolf staff and volunteers go door-to-door, -door, neighborhood by neighborhood, to educate citizens about local resources available for at-risk pets and to help their families connect with those resources. Brother Wolf's community-based approach to no no Kill helps keep family pets healthy, happy, and in their homes and out of the local shelter system in the first place. For more information or to make a tax-deductible donation to this wonderful 501c3 organization, visit their website at www.bwar.org. Help to realize Brother Wolf's vision when no animal is euthanized for lack of a home. Who's a good boy? <laughs> Disgusting. It was like a drive through for bad dreams. Marty Winston with a news tips bulletin review for Computer America. This time, Alchemate Revo. Add a little alcohol vapor to a fuel cell and you get a voltage. 
inside the Alchemate Revo, that's how they get a reading. Now, officially, that's more an indication than a measurement, but it's a reading of blood alcohol content that you get when you blow into a pipette mouthpiece attached to its inlet port. Inside, the sensor module shows you something you haven't seen there before, an expiration date. And the instructions say to replace it after a thousand uses or one year, whichever comes first. The one we got for review expires in seven months. A pair of AAA cells powers it all. Bottom line, Alchemate Revo is one way that those who choose to check may make a responsible decision no matter what the numbers say. Marty Winston, News Tips Bulletin for Computer America. Welcome back to the Computer America Show. And, you know, credit to, uh, you know, credit to, uh, holy crap, I forgot his name. Uh, Mart, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I am so out of it. But, no, uh, credit to him. He, you know, uh, for a while there he struggled with the openers, but he seems to be pulling them out of, I don't know where, out of thin air every single Yeah, he does some week. But, uh, yeah, that, that was Marty with, uh Marty Winston with the new simple trivia. You're having a tough day, Marty, man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I keep on saying Marty Wilson, but Marty Wilson is not a person. No uh, yes, he is. He's a good buddy of mine. He lives down the street from here, Marty Wilson. Ah, well, that, that Marty Wilson. But I have noticed that uh, the, the, the browser uh, won't go to a Linux tracker. Firefox won't go there, but I launched Safari, and it let me go there. For some reason, Firefox won't, can't, won't look at Linux tracker. Go figure. That's really fascinating, actually. You have Firefox? Give it a try and see if it'll... it'll well, let's, let's, yeah, I've got Firefox open here. Let me just uh, do that. In fact, I've got Firefox open on the other Linux distribution that I was yeah. going to try here. So. That's the LinuxTracker.org will not come up. It says it, it resets. But when I'm, I launch Safari, it goes right to it. So oh, go figure. I've never, I haven't seen it. It opened perfectly on Firefox here. Well, like, could you live, live in Canada, maybe? That's what <laughs> I don't know. Let me, let me try. Uh, no, it, it worked perfectly. It did. And I'm... I'm uh, right. well, on Firefox is open on Firefox as we. All right, but before the break, for anyone just joining us for any reason, uh, first of all, go check out the uh, you know the archive of the show because you should really listen to the entirety of the show and all of our off-topicness. But uh, before the break, we were talking about how uh, Linux, how uh, torrenting, where most people associate it with, of course, the the illegal activities of the day. Uh, you know, more and more people really just use torrenting as a nice way of, or at least a very efficient way of sharing files that they may own themselves. So, you know, we were just getting into that, and uh, yeah, and, and I guess this website that you uh, pointed us to that we're talking about, uh, Linux Tracker, actually points people to, uh, you know, <clears throat> commonly downloaded distributions of Linux, and I guess some of those are torrents? Yes, well, there are, the the site is all torrents. Right. Uh, as, as I was gonna, as I was pointing out, um, I, I have gone to download, and and again, remember, I try a lot of different distributions. I mean, it's part of what I do. I, I try a lot of different distributions, and I've gone to sites where it is taking you forever. It's like you know, you take a look at it, and it's like, well, this will be downloaded in an hour and twenty minutes. You've <laughs> got to be kidding me! And it's because they've got a very small pipe going into an FTP server somewhere, and it's just, I'm sorry, but if you're going to download it directly from the FTP site, it's going to take a while. However, torrent sites, you know, have trackers that share bits and pieces of the data across multiple systems. So, in short, what you can do then is you can open pipes to, you know. 20, 30 different, you know, seeds, mm -hmm. people that are sharing the file that you're trying to download, and uh, you can access it quite a bit faster. So I, I routinely go here, and I wanted, I, I hadn't ever given it a nod on the show before, but I, I want to do it today because we're talking big files, and uh, and it's not always the, the most efficient way is not always to go to the distribution directly and to download it because it's going to take a heck of a long time. Um, this was one of those times I, I downloaded it, and it's like this mass, you know, is uh, I forget 1.2 gig or something like that, and it was down in you know 45 seconds or something like that by using a torrent. It was. Obviously, the more people are sharing the file on BitTorrent, the uh, faster it's going to download. But it it can be really, really nice yeah. to be able to do that. You can. You, it's amazing how fast you can download things sometimes with BitTorrent. It, it's it's amazing what happens when you have you know tons and tons of cedars and not that many leechers. Uh, you yep. know, cedars are people who have the files on their computer, and you can download from their files onto your computer. So you know, imagine downloading. The same file instead of from one place at one yep. at one restricted speed, you download from 70 places at a time 
and download at you know 70 different speeds much much faster and and for you know I, I I know you know this Ben because of just the way that you're saying this uh, the way that you're explaining it you have a little bit of experience with using torrents um, but it it helps you know it, it helps if you're gonna take advantage of the fact that you're downloading like a, the, the next distribution that I'm gonna talk about I downloaded that way using Linux tracker and um, it helps to keep the torrent going for a while. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you took advantage of the fact that all these people were providing you with this huge pipe to download it. So you know, help out, be a. Oh, oh, it's while. it's it's a courtesy that I think yep. not many people yep. extend to others. Yeah, I mean, I don't leave it. I don't leave it going forever. But right. uh, but if I've downloaded something and it, and it's useful to me and so forth, I will you know I'll leave the torrent up for several hours just so yep. that other people can take advantage of, you know, me having taken advantage of them, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it yeah, is. It's courtesy. It is common courtesy. So, See, and, and, and I'm the exact opposite. I I restrict uploading and I upload nothing and I uh, delete the torrent immediately after I download it. It's you know just well it depends I'm on selfish. what it depends on what it is. Okay, I mean not that I would ever do that, but if right, I right, say right. If, let's say that if I missed the last episode of a particular show that I really liked and I went and picked it up off a of torrent because I neglected to you know uh, to uh, record it on my DVR, which happens more often, more times. Like <laughs> I know I can set it to record at a particular time, but 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 you know not that I did this, but pretend that I had done that. And <laughs> right. I needed to get a show. Yes, I immediately. Immediately download. I immediately remove it after that. I don't. I do not continue to share that. Okay? Right. So, but a Linux distribution, I'll leave. Oh, it share there. share all day long. Yeah, I'll I'll leave it for several hours. Some you know sometimes days. You know if it's something that I thought was particularly cool. I I, I do believe in extending that courtesy, and and partly because, you know, the there's there's no gray area here. It is free to share and free to download, and uh, and I don't have any trouble with that whatsoever. As long as you're not dealing with copyrighted material, sure. Exactly. No, no, it's it's. I mean, it's free software. It's completely free software. And uh, but but I can un I can understand. Uh, you know, under other circumstances, uh, you know, Ben's uh, Ben's feelings on that. Anyway, so the the one that I downloaded today, which I want to point out, not not today, but I downloaded a couple of days ago, was something called Solus. S O L U S. Okay, and um, Solus is. I, I is interesting because it's not an Ubuntu derivative. It's not really a derivative. It's it's actually a Linux from scratch. Somebody decided to basically create a distribution, and they've they've just released the 1.0 version. You know the the, the gold you know uh, non beta non alpha version of it. Um, to find to find Solus, you can go to Solus S O L U S hyphen project dot com. Okay. Um, and I believe that if you go on their download page, you can actually find a link to a Linux tracker if you, you know, if you uh, if you go there. It's interesting because it's really different. Okay, um, you know, I, I tell you that every once in a while, I just, you know, I I, I yearn for t to see something that you know takes a really different approach. Um, to the way that they present things, and uh, and this one really is different. First of all, it's a Linux from scratch. So somebody has you know has, has created this thing from the ground up, basically. Um, they have uh, a cool menuing system called Budgie, B-U-D-G-I-E, and um, it's it's reminiscent. I'm going to use that term. It's it's like a cross between the 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 uh, say it window. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm not saying it. it's it's not Windows. It, it's it's kind of a cross between uh, what you see on a Chromebook, uh, the menu that you see on a Chromebook, and uh, the menu that uh, that OpenZUSA was using. Um, I'm trying to remember the, the the name of that particular desktop, but it's a, it's, it's an application context sensitive sort of menu. Um, but it's 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 got a feel of a little of both of those in the way that it presents the information. The desktop is is quick, it's peppy. Um, I, I won't quite call it minimalist because it's it's prettier than that. Um, but it's um, it's kind of neat. Um, I I've been playing with it. I've been using it. In fact, when you told me to uh, to fi you know to load up Firefox, uh, I loaded up Firefox on there, and um, if somebody wants to try something that isn't, you know, yet another Ubuntu derivative or yet another, you know, version of, um, you know, Fedora slash Red Hat or something, um, you, you know, I, I highly recommend that you check this one out. It's, it's, it's neat. It's neat. Okay. It's just, it's, it's something different. It's something that you haven't tried yet. You know, if you try a lot of different Linux distributions. Okay. Solus. 
right. Solus, S O L U S. And, and it's and it's pretty. It actually is. It's 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 nice. It's clean. It's um, when you go to why Solus, it says uh, it says sorry, we're on vacation. We can't tell you why. Does it really say that? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> ah, that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> this this page will be restored in time for the final release. Our wordsmith is currently on vacation. That's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> I can't find out why Solus, but there it is. Oh, that's hilarious! I didn't actually ever go there, but that's funny. That's really funny. Anyway, it's 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 like I said, it's different. It's it's not the same old thing. Okay. Um, so you know, I if you want to try something different, if you want to get an idea of just you know why people spin up uh, different Linux distributions and you know and what they're trying to achieve, mm -hmm. then uh, you know it's it's one of those things that's that's worth checking out because sure. it's I okay. wanted to do something different, and here it is. There it is. Okay, so now it's Linux playtime, and. <laughs> Oh no 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 no! I I know I know I'm gonna I'm gonna jump I'm gonna jump beyond this okay I'm gonna oh, jump beyond okay. this no I know I know I know I know I'm sorry, <laughs> sorry. okay <clears throat> I I routinely talk about I mean running trying out a lot of different things is 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 fun but you know you, if if you do it as often as I do you don't want to burn a disc every time right so you run a virtual machine mm -hmm. okay. And I decided to mention this today because of something that happened. Uh, I use uh, a number of different um, uh, uh, VPS companies out there. Uh, I use one called uh, OVH, uh, which is a Canadian company. I also use Linode, uh, which I've used for a number of years, L-I-N-O-D-E dot com. And uh, Linode, Linux, Node, get it, Linode? Anyway, um, Linode... Uh, recently, and, and this is kind of what made me think about it, recently decided to switch from Zen, which was uh, the virtualiz virtualization uh, architecture that we're using, to KVM. Mm -hmm. KVM uh, came on the scene, I mean, it's been a few years now, it's not like it's yesterday, but it's, it's a few years ago now. Um, was interesting because it was fully supported in the kernel on Linux distributions. So unlike Zen, where you had to have a special patched kernel, you know, in order to be able to run virtual machines, uh, KVM was new and exciting, and uh, a lot of it, as I recall, was the work of Red Hat. Um, KVM allowed you to, you know, you didn't have to load anything special. If you had a kernel after a specific date, um, it was going to have KVM. It was going to have the virtualization engine built into it, and all you needed was a processor, uh, as in, you know, a, uh, a CPU that that could handle it. And nowadays. I'd be hard pressed to find a computer that couldn't do virtualization. It's just, you know, okay, it's everywhere. It's just, it's just, you know, it's everybody's got a big enough processor. These everybody's got a big enough processor these days to run virtualization. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. Anyway, um, and the classic virtualization software, partly I suppose. Uh, because it's been available on the Mac and it's been available uh, on Windows and it's been available on Linux was VirtualBox, and we've talked about VirtualBox on the show before. I know that. Um, and uh, VirtualBox was bought out by Oracle, you know, countless years ago. It feels like now. Uh, it was first an open source project. It was, uh, you know, it was bought out by Oracle, and Oracle, Oracle still makes it available free to anybody who wants to download it. But KVM has increasingly become, you know, really simple and uh, I mean, it's been mature for a long time, but it's become simpler than ever in terms of spinning up uh, Linux distributions, or for that matter, Windows distributions, or anything else you might want to run on a virtual machine. And I mention it because I'm running Fedora 23 now. You remember a couple of shows ago I decided to abandon whatever I was running and run Fedora? Yes. I hadn't done it for a while. Well, I'm still running Fedora, believe it or not. It's been two months now. Yay! Two <laughs> months I've been running the same Linux distribution. <laughs> You Who says I can't commit? <laughs> Who says I can't commit? Two months now. Two months I've been running the same distribution. Impressive. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm a man who can commit. All right, so uh, I'm running Fedora, and I went to install VirtualBox, and I'll be damned if it wasn't a real pain. It was just not working out well. And so I was sort of kicking myself going, I, I don't need this. I don't need to fight this. You know, Why am I doing this? And then there's that part of your brain that goes, dude, dude. You realize, of course, that you've got KVM. It's just there. You know, you can run a machine at KVM, yeah. and it's like, oh yeah, yeah. Of course, I remember that. You know, you, you get used to. You know, even when you know better, sometimes you do what 
you know, you do what isn't necessarily best for you. So I, I started, uh, I, I started running something in, entirely different, which I've run for years to run virtual machines on other systems, and uh, and that's KVM, Q E M U slash KVM, but KVM is quite of the short form, and something called Virtual Machine Manager. Virtual Machine Manager is a graphical front end to KVM, and in fact it supports Zen as well, so you know I'll give a nod out there, but a virtual front end to KVM that allows you to Basically, with the click of a button, and I'm doing it here, uh, Virtual Machine Manager, if Ben wants to go look it up out there somewhere, uh, you can specify a local install media, like an ISO file that you've downloaded, a network install, a network boot, or you can import a disk image from some other distribution, like VirtualBox, for instance. Um, and, you know, you assign a disk, you know, a size of a disk that you want to it, you point it at the file, and you can basically create virtual machines on the fly. It's... If you'll pardon the expression, it's much more utilitarian looking than <laughs> virtual boxes. Virtual box looks honestly, you know, pretty slick. It looks like something you know Oracle would have produced, uh, although you know they're not the original brains behind it. But it, but it looks like something a, a big company produces because it's a lot slicker on the front end. Whereas Virtual Machine Manager um, is uh, a Python front end, as if I remember correctly. It's written in Python. Um, it's it's fine. It works perfectly well. It does everything the other one does, but it, like I said, it does look a lot, you know, here, this is what you need to do to make it work, and away <laughs> you go. And uh, consequently, it's a lot lighter on resources, and because it uses KVM, uh, it's, you know, it can be pretty darn efficient. Uh, so I wanted to toss that one out there, Virtual Machine Manager. Uh, maybe I should have put a link to that in the, in the show notes. Have you been able to find it there, Ben? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Virtual. Ma yeah. I, I, I didn't know what we do with it. Uh, virtual machine. Manager, yeah. Just right? you know, maybe pop up a picture of what it looks like on, on the screen yeah, if, if if you've got a a picture of it there. But um, it's 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 easy. It's ridiculously easy. And if you've got anything resembling a modern machine, it'll work. You know, you can fire up a machine on the fly. There it using is. Virtual machine manager. It's it's so easy. It's so frightfully easy. And uh, and uh, you don't have to go and install somebody else's software to do it. Just Bing, bang, boom, away you go. All right. And then All right. In the live video, you can see it. Ben's actually. Yeah. There you go, Ben. Yeah, exactly. I got ben. you. I got you. Ben has got this under control. Thank <laughs> you, Ben. Anyway, um, so, th yeah, I'm just just pointing it out. It's 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 what you want to use if you're going to try that. Right. Um, and because I, I skipped over games. Linux uh, Playtime. <laughs> oh, you want to go to Playtime? Yeah. Oh, okay, you want to go to Playtime. He wants to go to Playtime. I want to, what is this? All right. Um, I, I I wanted to sort of talk about some of the games I've been uh, I've been starting to play. I've gotten totally hooked uh, playing um, SimCity Build It on Android. Mm -hmm. I am SimCity Build It. S I M C I T Y Mm -hmm. Build it, B U I L D I T. I mean, SimCity has been available on PCs in different flavors for you know for a number of years now. So it, it's not like it's a newcomer to PCs by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but it's there's a version available uh, which was released uh, like just a little over a year ago, and it's now like one of the most popular, most played games uh, on the Android platform. Um, I am having a ball with this. My wife Sally is hooked on it. I'm hooked on it. Uh, my son Tristan, my eight-year-old, isn't quite as hooked on it as we are because he's a big Clash of Clans guy. He's a big Clash of Clans uh, Minecraft guy. But um, but he's enjoying playing SimCity as well. And you get hooked into it. As an adult, I think you particularly get hooked into it because the idea is that you create a city, uh, you, you build housing developments, you have to provide everything for the city. You have to provide water services, electricity, um, um, uh, garbage collection, sewage. It's it's amazing how many things you have to think about. You build factories to build raw materials, uh, which you then send to various stores to produce. You know, uh, to to sell, so that you can sell goods, so you can keep your city going. It's completely, utterly fascinating. So I've gotten. I started playing another game 
before SimCity, which was called um, which was called Dominations, which was a cross between kind of Clash of Clans and Civilization, where you yes you're going out and fighting other people and so forth, but you start in an early age and then you build up through the various ages, you know Stone Age, Bronze Age, uh, Iron Age, uh, Classical Age, uh, Medieval Age, Gunpowder Age, you know all the way up to the Space Age and so forth. So these kinds of uh, I've gotten hooked on um, on simulation games like that. So mm -hmm. in Linux, I decided to pick up a couple of big simulation games, and I started playing Civilization V and Beyond Earth, both of which are brilliantly done. I mean, they're beautifully done. You know, uh, taking advantage of this the Steam you know multi architecture stuff, and uh, giving you the opportunity to just sort of extend that whole you know. Um, creation of a culture or a civilization, you know, and extending it and building it and making it more complex and interacting with your neighbors, sometimes fighting them, sometimes, you know, buying and selling with them and so forth. And beyond Earth, just sort of, you know, we get into the science fiction, science fictional element of, you know, of colonizing another world and having to deal with, the, you know, the local uh, hostiles or, or the local food sources and so forth. So this is kind of my new, uh, you know, Linux-based game obsession. And I, um, I, I I can safely say that Civilization Five, like it, it's a game that I picked up when it was on sale via Steam. I mean, I I think I picked up Civ Five for like three bucks one year. I got it uh, as a humble bundle with a whole bunch of other things. So. Yeah, it, it's you know great stuff, and I I picked it up and like it 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 serves that need that I get sometimes whenever I play video games. Like, sure, I can play you know. Uh, the latest game, I, uh, the latest game, whatever. But sometimes I get the the, the itch to play, you know, Civ Five, uh, Warcraft Three, uh, you know, just just games that are older, but you know, are very very unique. And Civ Civ Five definitely does. I haven't played after uh, After Earth or Beyond Earth. Beyond Earth, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, Beyond Earth. But uh, you'd like um, it. I mean, you'd like it. It's very cool. I, I, I hear it's just like Civ Five, but. With space, so exactly, yeah. It would, like I said, you're colonizing another planet, so you have to. It's it's different in the sense that there are a lot of there are a lot of um, there are a lot of historical references that you can sort of tie into when you're playing something like Civ Five because you, you you sort of know how you have to deal with other people and other cultures. I mean, these are all. Whereas you sort of have to figure it out as you go along. They're 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 uh, with uh, Beyond Earth. You know, it's 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 not as obvious right. because you know they've they've created a world that isn't ours. Basically, so. Well, yeah, I, I, I mean, so five. You know that if you're going to deal with the Germans, they're yeah. rather warlike sometimes. <laughs> yeah, and, and you have to expect that. Yeah, so so you do have some historical context, right. you know that, and 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 they set it up that way. They set it up that way. They say these cultures were really good at this. They were really good at that. And uh, the 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 other game that I told you that sort of you know launched me into this area, Dominations, is very much like that. It's like. You know, you align yourself with a particular culture and history, and here are its strong points. You know, these are the skills that they bring to the table that you're then going to use. What's interesting about these games, any of these games, is that they... Remember the Tamagotchi, Craig? Of course. Yes, yes of course. Okay, the, the, the mystery of the Tamagotchi, okay? It was a mystery for adults, Okay, adults didn't get it. It's like, why are you spending so much time at this? Because I, it doesn't make any lot. sense. You have to feed your pet, you know, your your weird digital pet. You have to feed it. You have to pay attention to it. You have to take care of it and stuff like that. And it's like, why would you want to do that? You know, what? This doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Well, these games like Civ, you know, Civ Five, Beyond Earth, um, and of course, like I said, SimCity Build It on the Android platform, um, are interesting because it's like they need you. You know, you yeah. don't un unlike unlike a game where you have to sit there. You know, it's like blah, 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 you know, you're playing and it's like it's immediate and you got to do things. You know, and so forth. These are games where you can set things up and let them sort of stew in the background, and then you come back to it later. But the thing is, you have to come back to it later, okay? So you don't have to spend, like, hours playing this game. I suppose you could, but you don't... It, it, they're not set up that way. They're set up in a way, here are the things I'm going to need. So I've got my factories producing these raw materials, and I've got my stores, you know, uh, you know, taking advantage of these goods, and then I'm going to be trading these with these other partners. So I'm going to put I, this in my, in my global market and stuff like that. I, you don't have to be there all the time. I think what you're alluding to is that these games, like, 
where, where others, it's uh, where the games you know require precision, accuracy, and you know strategy and whatnot. Uh, this game ad, you know, adds the element of time, where you need time to let things progress, and you know it, it, that's a very uh, it can be a very fun thing, but you know other games kind of abuse it and uh, you know let you skip the element of time by microtransactions. Laying and, well, but all, pretty much all of these do. Go ahead, and, Craig. And speaking of time, we're pretty much out of it. What? <laughs> what? Yeah. How um, oh, quick? Yeah, quick. It just flew on by. Uh, Marcel, just let our listeners know what you're up to, uh, where people can go read about what you do uh, on the web. Um, I'll. Uh, you can always go to cookingwithlinux.com, but I also uh, one of the things I do a lot lately is I've been updating. Whenever I see a story that's interesting in the Linux and open source world, uh, I've been adding it to my Flipboard magazine. If you go to flipboard.com and you look for Cooking with Linux, uh-huh. and, uh, and I, I have I have pasted the link here. I'm sure of it before. If you go to flipboard.com and uh, you look for it's at Wooftel, so flipboard.com. I wonder if you can just go slash at Wooftel. WFTL, by the way, is my handle, writer and free thinker at large. I use it all over the place. So if you're looking for me, you'll find me that way. If you go to flipboard.com slash at WFTL, you'll see my my various magazines that I curate there. And uh, one of them is called Cooking with Linux. And anything having to do with Linux and open source that I find interesting, I post in there. So, um, so some of the stories that you read about today, I have posted in there. I've got uh, I've got magazines on uh, on uh, survival craft and Minecraft. I've got uh, magazines on robots. I, I'm, I'm lately bec- I've be- lately become ridiculously fascinated with robots. But uh, but like I said, if you're in Linux and open source, I've got several hundred people seconds. That follow the magazine on a regular basis. It's a great place to stay on top of things. All right, excellent. <laughs> Marcel, we're pretty much out of time. Again, I know. I want to thank you so much for being with us. Obviously, stay with us to the end. Uh, coming up tomorrow, of course, we're going to have our social media winner of the week. That's all coming up. In the first hour, we're going to have a company called Nanoleaf. Uh, they, they, if you're into uh, 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 lighting uh, that can be controlled, uh, uh, LED lighting, they, they've got this bulb called the Nanoleaf that is just seconds. crazy to look at. Uh, we're going to have the company's CEO, uh, Jimmy Chu, is going to be joining us on, on that. Uh, and As home has become far more integrated with the Internet of Things and controlling lights, uh, it's just uh, going to be a very interesting first hour. And then in the second hour, we'll have computer and technology news brought to you by Slimware Utilities, the official optimization software of Computer America. Again, I want to thank you all for being with us here on our All Linux show. Thanks, Marcel, and uh, we'll see you next month. And Ben and I will see you tomorrow afternoon, same time, same place. So until tomorrow afternoon, (laughs) this is Craig Crossman hoping that your hard disk never becomes floppy. We'll see you tomorrow afternoon. (laughs) Bye, everyone. (laughs) Bye. Ten seconds. Thank you for using Blog Talk Radio. Goodbye. Okay, again, everybody, thanks so much for watching us here on the show. Thanks, Marcel. Thank it's, you. It was been a lot, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, it's it. always fun. And we'll see you next month, okay? <laughs> All right, take care okay. out there. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye, Ben. Bye. Bye. Bye.